Good evening, councillors, staff and ladies and gentlemen of the gallery. Welcome to the first Agenda Forum of 2020. We hope that you enjoyed your Christmas break and we look forward to a prosperous and adventurous new year. I'll read the disclaimer. Agenda Forums are specifically for items on the agenda which are to be considered at the, council, at the next Ordinary Council meeting. Agenda forums are not decision-making forums. They provide an opportunity for councillors to be equally informed and seek additional information on matters prior to the presentation of such matters at the next Ordinary Council meeting. Please note that this meeting is being live-streamed. The recording will also be archived and made available on the councillors' website after the meeting. If you choose to participate in the meeting during public question time and deputation time, it is assumed that your consent is given for the audio to be recorded. Please keep your comments respectful to others and council members and members of the community. Visual images of the public will not be captured. Uh, attendance and apologies, Mr. CEO. Uh, Mr. Mayor, everyone's present except we have an apology from Councillor Scanlon, Councillor Podovic's on leave of absence, and Councillor Williams is running late. I think Thank that's you, Mr. Everyone. CEO. Declarations of financial and proximity interest and interest affecting impartiality, Mr. CEO. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a number, a number of those. Councillor Bryce Perry has indicated that in relation to items 310 and 312, that's the proposed outbuilding security booth and classrooms at uh, the Chin Chin Church. Um, he's declared impartiality as the manager of the church is an acquaintance that has worked that he's worked with in the in the past. Um, Councillor Mel Congleton's indicated that he is an impartiality in relation to item 3.3, that's the Henley Book Structure Plan, in that the planning consultant, one of the planning consultants has previously done work for him. And in relation to item 3.7, lot 5, um, Cranley Street, um, Dayton, um, he indicated exactly the same issue that the planning consultant has uh, previously undertaken work for him and he has declared an impartiality. Councillor Charlie Zanino, um, has declared a financial interest in item 5.3, that's budget adjustments, in that um, he, one of the items there, he is the owner of the Swan Valley Central, which has got a budget adjustment, Mr Mayor, and he's declared a financial interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr CEO. Any other declarations from either staff or councillors? None. Thank you. Uh, public question time. Questions relating to reports contained in the agenda. 5.1 is questions for which due notice has been given. There are questions there from Ms Janet Benaim on behalf of the Upper Swan uh, Resident Ratepayers Association. Is Ms Benaim in the gallery? You have those questions and answers? Okay, are there any questions arising from those answers? Um, yes. Uh, well, question one, I found that um, my question wasn't detailed enough to assist in the reply, so I, I've slightly adjusted my question, it doesn't change the answer. Is that all right? OK, if you could just put a little oh. bit closer to my voice. Oh, right. Oh, a bit closer. Can you hear me now? Now? No? Down a bit? <laughs> Give it a go. Right. So I've adjusted the question slightly, but it doesn't affect the answer. OK. okay. If that's all right with you. Yeah, that's fine. So, right. So, uh, so we're talking about a, a council decision in 1997 when council approved additional use transport depot on lot 16 and lot 32, Great Northern Highway. And this is in relation to the um, proposed rezoning of one, um, Amendment 150. Uh, let's see. So they uh, uh, approved this... Um, reclassification on the condition that those uses reflect the current ap approved uses on the site and that any additional uses be considered in the context of light industrial use and impact with justification as to the need and acceptance within the Upper Swan Town site. Um, so as a result of that council decision, uh, Amendment 317 was uh, created the additional use transport depot. Hey, Ms. Graham, can you just ask the question, oh. please? Have you heard anything? Yeah, we've heard you, but <laughs> if you could just get to the question, it would be fine. I'll get to Thank the question. Yeah. So as a result, um, Amendment 317 
created the transport depots on lot 16 and lot 32 with ministerial approval in 1999. And the question is, um, or the answer to that question was, it is important to note that the council decision of 1997 does not and cannot bind the council of 2018 and 2019 and it is a fact that the council consideration of Amendment 150 is not on an assumption that the use being sought is light industrial type use. Um, so my rewriting of that um, question is um, where they say that um, the council decision in 1997 doesn't bind the council now, does Scheme Amendment 317 bind the Council because that got ministerial approval um, when it was considering the approval of DA 774 for the transport depot okay. of um, transporting bitumen and um, storing bitumen? Okay, I'll see um, if I can get an answer from that one. Mr Tan or Mr Russell? Thank you, Mr Mayor. In short, I reiterate the answer provided in the green folder, no. The amendment that was done previously in 97 has just becomes part of the scheme. The council can amend its scheme at any time, constantly, if it wishes. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Has there been? Can I ask if there has been an amendment superseding amendment 317? Mr. Russell. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, it's the amendment in front of you. Yep, that's the amendment that's we're dealing with at the moment. So. Um, can I ask this question in relation to DA 774, which was approved in 2016? Was it binding in 2016? Mr Russell? Yes. The amendment uh, that was approved, which talked about bitumen storage, made it clear that you can't process the bitumen. Bitutech were in breach of that. Bitcher Tech were notified and given an order to cease that operation. To the best of my knowledge, they ceased. They lodged this amendment uh, to uh, enable consideration of the capacity to blend bitumen on the site, and that's what we're dealing with. Does that make uh, sense? Well, Amendment 317 says, so I'm going back to, I'm trying to find out if Amendment 317 was still binding at the time they approved the DA because even though it was 1997 when this was approved, the council did not want general industry there and, and on, historically they have not approved general industry and they said we'll, we're willing to approve this, this transport depot on the condition that it's no more than the use that was there historically. Okay, I uh, think uh, Mr Russell explained that in the, the no. approval was to transport depot and they were in breach when they started to process bitumen. Hence, they have uh, a further scheme amendment before us today for us to consider the possibility mm. of making that a legal use. So. I'm, I guess I'm questioning the veracity of approving the DA in light of what the conditions were placed on amendment 317. I'm saying, can you approve bitumen transport for the DA if Amendment 317 is still in, in um, still binding the D in, in relation to the development application. I know what's happened, um, but I'm saying, was it possible to approve the DA when, when Amendment 317? Mr Russell? Yes, it was, because if it wasn't legally possible, it wouldn't have been approved. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I don't think Ms Smith quite heard that answer, Mr Russell, if you wouldn't mind. I beg your pardon, Mr Mayor, I'll say it again. The short answer is yes. If it wasn't legally possible to approve the storage of the bitumen, we wouldn't have approved it. Thank you. And Further just I, I don't, yeah. Is heated bitumen storage and transport and the transport of that considered a light industry under LPS 17? Mr Russell? The definition of a light industry is an industry that doesn't have any emissions that adversely affect the amenity of the locality in the opinion of the council. 
So we're not treating this amendment is not contemplating the blending of bitumen as a light industry. It is clearly a general industry. No. No one's suggesting that it's a light industry. I'm referring to the DA, not the uh, not the rezoning before us. I'm saying is heated bitumen storage and transport considered a light industry under the local planning scheme? Mr Mayor, I think the DA condition made it clear. It's on the condition. You can't blend, process or heat the bitumen. And that's the condition on the DA. That made it storage as opposed to processing. They want to heat and process the bitumen, hence this amendment. Okay. In other words, under your current, the current DA and approvals, your answer is no. Heated bitumen and storage, they were doing on the, under the DA. They, they were in the tanks, they were filling tanks. And if I heard Mr Russell correctly, they were found in breach of their current approval and were issued with a cease and desist. Okay. Shall I move on? Yes, answer and ask another question. Okay, the second question is, um, let's see. Do they relate to the questions and answers you currently got? Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, the City in its report to Council on the 30th of August 2017 for the initiation of Swan Amendment 150 points out that all physical structures on the land had already been approved. In August 2017, the Department of Water of Diwa found the facilities operated had, operators had constructed a bitumen manufacturing facility on the pre premises without Diwa approval. Um, the ratepayers and residents require an explanation from the city as to why a development application, DA774, um, was approved prior to initiating the required re rezoning, allowing a pro prescribed premises to be constructed. And, uh, and your answer, um, the development application is an application made pursuant to the city's local planning scheme upon which a decision is reviewable in accordance with the scheme, and I don't understand what you mean. Mr Russell? Um, I'm respectfully, Mr Mayor, I'm, I'm struggling to understand the question, so oh. I'll, I'll do my best here. Yeah. As I understand, the questioner is asking or is alluding to the fact that the Department of Water and Environment Regulation issued a notice or identified the bitch tech were in breach for undertaking an activity. I'm not disputing that. That may well be the case. That wasn't the case when their application 774 was submitted. And in any event, it was made very clear under our planning scheme with the uh, conditions on the development approval, no processing. I can't make it any clearer than that. So, like a lot of things, and particularly with industrial activities, Proponents have to get a multiplicity of approvals under various state statutes, as we know, inclusive of works and licensing approvals by the Department of Water uh, and Environment Regulation. So we are only regulating, if they're in breach of that, that was, to my understanding, subsequent to the issue of the uh, uh, planning approval. In any event, as I've already stated, it came to our attention they were in breach. They were doing blending activities. They were directed to cease and desist. They did so again, to the best of my knowledge, and they proceeded through the ordinary process of lodging this proposal to contemplate whether or not they may be in a position to subsequently make a planning application for the blending facility. Thank you. Mr Russell. Oh, I have something to say further to that, but um, just a comment that we, we are presenting a, a diary of um, <coughs> DIWA um, online pollution reporting, uh, which over three, it, that goes over three years to say they didn't see okay. well, You can present that to us if you have it. Pardon? Do you have that to present to us, yes, did you say? I, I, could we ask, I could ask someone to read it? Could I just finish? Oh, no, well, we're doing deputations later. Is that part of the deputation no. from Upper oh, Swan Ratepayers? Of, yes, okay, well, then we'll, we'll receive yeah. that then. All right. Um, Mr Russell mentioned that uh, conditions were placed, uh, DWA placed commissions that, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting all jumbled now. <laughs> 
Uh, DUI have placed regulations, they require a works approval from the, um, they ask the proponent to provide a works approval uh, from them before, um, oh, sorry, before the um, operation of the approved additions to the site. That's under the DA that they had approved additions. And they were required under condition, uh, they were required under condition four to seek a, a works approval from DIWA before they operated the approved additions. That means the tanks and the workshop. However, um, in 2000, 2017, they did put in an application. But that condition four um, actually says, by its operation, that DEWA um, has stated that they cannot provide a works approval until the land use is solved. That means they can't provide a works approval until the site is rezoned. And we are wondering, uh, therefore, condition four prevents the operation of the facility under the, till the site has the proper land use approval under the scheme. It prevents the use of the storage tanks and new workshop until the site is rezoned. I, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm not a planner, so I may be wrong, but I don't understand condition four. And okay, how about we ask a planner to answer the question? Mr Russell? <clears throat> um, I'll say this, Mr Mayor. In my experience and over the time, the approach that Dura has taken or its preceding agencies to the issue of works approval licences has been a, 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 um, a chicken and the egg. In some instances, and we've been party to that as well, in some instances we've said we're not going to issue an industry approval under a DA until you've got the environmental works approval and the licence. The same agency said, as you've heard it from the speaker tonight, well, we're not going to issue a works approval or licence until you've got a DA. It goes like that. And in my time in this job, I've seen it go, do or operate independently and issue works approvals and licences independently as they are able to do under their legislation. And then I've seen them retreat backwards in a conservative sense and say, DA first. And we, to be fair, have taken the same approach in the reverse. It is a point in fact in law that there is nothing that prohibits Dewar from issuing that, as I said, to restate the point I made at the outset. When you have a multiplicity of laws in this state, you must comply with all of them. And there is nothing in any of the legislation that says that an approval issued by us means carte blanche for everything else or vice versa. It has always been that way, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Russell. Relevant authorities have each issued breaches uh, and threat, like formal letters of warning, but they haven't stopped the operation. So question three. Mm -hmm. When, this, when uh, Amendment 150 was received by the City of the Swan, the officer uh, doing the paperwork uh, said, spot rezoning will generally only be supported if the particular site specific circumstances are unique, the requested rezoning is of a special or urgent nature, and the resultant development will not adversely affect surrounding areas. Rather, the request should relate to a broader, more logical area or be considered as part of a major scheme review. Um, so our question was um, an explanation of the special or urgent nature for the proposed rezoning, as this was not discussed in the City's report to Council dated the 30th of August. Mr Russell. Just a being brief, Mr Mayor. Um, it is up to council to consider what's special the rest of it. The point in which they made Bitch Tech made this uh, 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 arrangement is that they were storing bitumen as a business and transporting it. What was explained to me is that it was necessary in many parts to heat the bitumen as a natural part of the process of storage and transportation, the rest of it. 
So they already had the facility there. They bought the facility for, as a transport depot. They were transport, and the transport depot at the time of the uh, approval allows the storage of the goods you transport and allows you to store uh, goods as well. So you might say that, uh, and what Bitutech communicated is, I suppose they said, we thought in good faith the transport depot allowed us to do what we, that we were doing. They said that as much to me in, a, and I'll be quite honest, a rather heated meeting when they found out that we were taking them to task for processing and heating the bitumen that uh, the condition uh, said, well, we can't approve that. It's an industry, general industry use. So to the extent you might say special circumstances, well, you can depend how you want to anoint special circumstances. The special circumstances in this was a situation where someone had bought the land, attained an approval, were running a business there, a sizeable one, thinking, as we see many times in this game, uh, uh, that in good faith they were allowed to do what they were doing. And sorry, sorry to say they weren't. So I suppose if you want to contemplate the special circumstances, those are what they are. With respect to the amenity, the issue that we've got in front of this fundamental question for this amendment is whether or not that facility can be approved, and we have, this amendment has to be supported before they can even get to the point of lodging the application, whether it can be approved with controls that ensure there is no odour and no noise. And if the answer to that on the balance of likelihood is yes, you can do it, and the advice and the amendment is from the expert agencies, yes, you can, it's a technology engineering matter, Mr Mayor, then I think we can be reasonably satisfied that you will be able to, if the council is mindful to support this and if the minister, in her wisdom, is mindful to support this, you can have a guaranteed process with the DA that you have all the necessary infrastructure upgrades to ensure that there is no odour from this facility and no noise. And if you smell no evil and hear no evil, Mr Mayor, is there any amenity impact? That's the question to be determined subsequently. Okay, thank you. Do you follow that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just on a point, uh, this company were apparently leasing the property. They said they were there since 2012. They didn't buy the property until 2015. <laughs> and they were in negotiation on this issue with the City of Swan in 2014. So it, it the, the second DA, I mean, the, the one that was approved is, was a second application. The first one was withdrawn. So they had been um, negotiating with the City of Swan since 2014, I believe. So the issue that they were caught or in, in, in um, I don't know how to say, unreasonably, uh, I don't think is right. Uh, so um, the only reason that the city gave to uh, residents in that the city's initiation report to council on the 30th of August, in conclusion, the, the city said, it would allow the landowner to develop the sub subject land for bitumen processing which would improve the commercial viability of the subject lots. And that's the only reason the City of Swan gave for rezoning, changing the additional use to bitumen processing. So, so if we had another question, if I could, is the answer to our question a purely economic one, just involving the owners of Bitchatech and not the residents' amenity, uh, land valuations, environmental, bushfire, you name it. Um, so thank you for... Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr Russell, but economic um, viability is not a planning consideration? If, if I could, Mr Mayor, it's a bit of both, OK? The proponents are wishing to use the land by a, an extension of their existing transportation and storage of bitumen as a bitumen uh, um, a contractor. Um, so there is... It's true to say that what they're doing, they've bought it, and they thought they could do what they were doing, uh, and they found that they couldn't. So there is a little bit of those circumstances from the applicant, as I've outlined the previous question. But the flip side of it is it's a balance. The question really is whether or not the proponents can do what they're wishing to do for the economics of their site and their business, which is, again, part of the scheme requirements is to ensure that there's lively uh, development of employment and business opportunities in the City of Swan. That's still a planning consideration. 
Uh, but it's got to be balanced, and I would say pre predominantly balanced, with the, sa with the satisfaction that the development of that business for bitumen processing will not adversely affect the surrounding community. Absolutely so. It's a bit of both of those considerations, with the primacy being on the latter, the amenity of the community. Thank you, Mr Russell. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Bim. Okay, we have some questions uh, from Ms Patsy Malloy that are there. Would you just like to come forward, Ms Malloy? They have not been answered yet, but I understand Mr Russell is going to attempt to answer them for you. Um, it was my understanding, um, uh, Mayor, that I would actually be able to address the background to those questions before I just simply ask the questions. No, Do no, I get no, to no, put the a deputation? Answered. Mr. Russell is going to answer them for you. And so, you know, places. the deputation that I've prepared is that a separate business yeah, that, that gets separate, said yeah. later. Yep, that comes oh, all right. Yeah. No worries. So, Mr. Um, Russell, do you have a copy of those questions? Would you like to work through them for Ms. Malloy? The, the background to the question has the City of Swan notified FISA of the fire risks relates to information in the deputation, which is about the tank storage of 220 kilolitres proposed to be 300 kilolitres. Okay, well, that's part of your deputation, so you've got right. a choice. You can either leave these questions and have them answered in full to appear in next week's agenda following your deputation, it, if you yeah. wish. Do I get the questions answered at the end of my deputation if I do it in that order? Yeah. Well, what we, no, what we can do, if you wish, Sorry. Mr Russell can take these questions on notice now. We'll listen to your deputation. He can answer them in full during the week and have them in the agenda for you at next week's council meeting. All and right. You'll get a copy part of that. If you'd like to do that, Thank then you, you can get any technical data that may be required you can have in your answers more fully. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that brings us now to 5.2 is questions without notice. And I believe Mr Brian Roberts has some questions without notice. Thank you, Mr Roberts. Thank you. My name's Brian Roberts. I uh, live in Henley Brook. I'm also representing uh, some neighbours, M&R &A, uh, sorry, M &A, sorry, M &A Anderson, K and V Bear and A L Vernon. In regards to um, the uh, POSs associated for the um, Henley Brook Structural Plan. The first question is, is the POS 6 consuming our homes, pools, sheds and water tanks? Mr Russell. Through Mr Mayor, any public open space depicted over a um, property owner's land holding uh, um, will take up all of their land holdings. It's important to note that this is in a structure plan. What it obliges then to happen, like any land that might be required for the purposes of a scheme, including of a structure plan, it would then place an obligation on the council to seek to negotiate the acquisition of the property owner's land. Uh, and if that wasn't able to be sorted out through a negotiated arrangement, then subsequently the city would need to pursue compul compulsory acquisition. So that's, that's what the, the process means in terms of any landowner that's got public open space over portion or the totality of their land under the structure plan if it's adopted. Yeah, the main issue I've got is that it's actually over our homes um, and the POS doesn't cover the whole area. So I'm a bit confused on where you're saying that it's, it's all consumed can you clarify Mayor, that? If, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't encompass the whole of the house, the, the, the portion proposed under the structure plan is what it is. If it's only a portion of it, then it's only a portion of it. In the ordinary course, in the ordinary course around all of these things, and as I said, the Commission's got to make the decision on that, the normal question would be if we're going to assume to take land for public open space under a structure plan, ultimately, then that's the process we need to negotiate. That might only happen uh, years down the track, depending on what happens with the timing of development, if there is any development under the structure plan. But that's, that's how it would operate, Mr Mayor. Further question, Mr Roberts? Yes, um, I'll skip two because that's basically covered there. Um, next, next one is, why can't the schools or associated POSs and community centres purposes be located on the WAPC land, formerly part of the Whiteman Park? Mr Russell? 
Well, the, the, I suppose the question is why can't it? Well, there might be no particular reason why it can't, but the structure plan being proposed is the structure plan for this zoned area. Whiteman Park is not zoned for residential development. Uh, so uh, it, this is the proposal to rezone, or this land's actually been rezoned. This is the proposal for this land to be subdivided up for urban purposes. And this particular area requires the provision of the infrastructure, the schools, the open space, etc., within it. So uh, that's the reason why we've got that. The, the Commission, of course, who approves all of this can take any of those considerations and do away with public open space or do away with schools, all the rest of it. But in the ordinary process, you need certain numbers of uh, amounts of public open space, as the council knows, and certain amounts of school and other facilities for, for urban residential development of this scale. And those are commonly provided within the area being divided, subdivided, uh, not within remote or other extraneous areas. Thank you, Mr. Russell. And the last one is: uh, Wasn't the Whiteman Park total intended to be dedicated to community purposes? Mr. Russell. I can't speak on the intention of, of, of Whiteman Park. It's, uh, I know it's been remarked on here. It's a regional <coughs> reservation. Thanks. That's, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Okay. Uh, any other questions uh, for which notice is... Well, he asked questions as deputation. You can't ask questions. Question, Tom. You can ask questions... No, it's not questions for councillors here, councillor. It's plenty of time. Any other questions without notice? Yes, the lady in the front row. If you just come to the microphone, state your name and ask your question. Uh, my name is uh, Catherine Marasco. Uh, I refer to the report on tonight's agenda titled Proposed Henleybrook Local Structure Plan and in particular, particular Section 4, Provision of Schools. Um, I have two questions. What are the full details of the compensation process that the Department of Education will undertake to acquire the Eastern School site? And the second one is, has any consideration been given to early acquisition for sites identified as primary schools? If so, what? And if not, will it be? Mr Russell? Very simply, Mr Mayor, as I know the Council knows full well, um, the requirements for uh, school sites of the Department of Education, and historically we've found they've chopped and changed. They're the ones that have to uh, acquire all of those and purchase those, so that's really out of the councils and the city's hand. There you go, Ms. Fresco. Thank you. Any further questions from our lady in the front row? Yes. If you could just state your name. Hello, my name is Nicole Gill. Um, I'm just commenting on the Henley Brook proposal, and I'm just wondering if the council can explain to me how the proposed area for development for many years was so valued that special rural zoning came in to protect the area. The original owners weren't allowed to use fertilisers or pesticides on these properties because the, it's part of the St Leonard's Brook catchment area and anything put on the ground runs straight into the Swan River. A tree planting scheme was also ordered that all owners of these lands had to plant trees because of the rising salinity issues which then factored into the Swan River. How is it that the owners of these lands for so many years had to abide by these rules because this was a very um, sought after ecological area that we had to protect the fauna, the flora, provide, you know, protect the groundwater, all of that, and protect the Swan River. And now, 18 years later, it can be concreted over. Mr. Russell. Mr. Mayor, I'll endeavour to be brief. It's the history of planning in the world. Rural areas and city locations become urbanised as there is demand for urban space. Everything that this lady has said is true 18 years ago. In 2000, and in fact, several years ago, in 2016 or 17, when this was rezoned, it was recognised as being prime for urban development. The state, in its wisdom, placed a high priority on the need for extra urban land for the expansion of this city uh, and saw fit to rezone the land. That decision's been made. 
uh, and that, that chapter has been closed. None of what is said here was not true at the time, but as we well know, in the, in the world of progress and growing cities, things change over time. Rural land in cities at the fringe or within is often eaten up and turned to the need of the majority of society, often for urban residential, urban housing and other urban uses. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Russell. So, so my second the, the question. Made that decision. My second question is when the City of Swan Council can see that the state government has made a decision that's going to destroy an ecological area that could harm our Swan River, that in an age of climate change and the loss of a number of Australian wildlife, Australia apparently um, loses 30% more wildlife every year than any other country on the planet. So when a state government makes a bad planning decision, is this council unable to do anything about it? Um, unfortunately, that's very difficult, and um, many of our councillors have been here, Ms. Sill, when we have advised the state government we do not agree with their planning decisions, and some of those are not too far away from you in Cavisham. Uh, there was uh, what was called an early release, release program implemented by the state some years ago to get, mark, um, get properties onto market in a hurry, and this city fought vehemently against those developments, and uh, the state being the state, and the Planning Commission uh, completely overruled us because they are the ultimate authority. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for which due notice has not been given? Thank you. That now takes us to reports and motions for which previous notions have uh, been given and presentations and deputations. And our first deputation tonight is item 2.1 on the Allenbrook Community Safety Patrol Surveys and Mr Lincoln Hayes representing the Allenbrook Neighbourhood Watch. And Mr Hayes, you have five minutes. Thank you. All right, firstly, um, thank you for the opportunity to present this deputation this evening. Um, I haven't done one before, so I apologise if the format isn't um, as you're used to. Um, my role here tonight is to present the, um, the sentiment of the community to you, to um, just give you a sense of uh, what the feeling is around Ellenbrook and um, also implore you to reconsider um, the recommendation in the paper, which is currently option one, to not reinstate the service. We are um, lobbying to actually get option two in, which is reinstatement of 24-7, based on um, this deputation. So our comments on option one. Um, our view is that the statements in the recommendation that reference there has not been a significant enough shift in, su in support are largely irrelevant. The fact that the majority of the respondents uh, about 53% voted in favour of reinstatement of the service should be what is considered. The response rate is also largely irrelevant in our view. Basically, if you want to have your say on something, you return a um, you return your say. This is the, this is why it works in federal and, and um, state elections and council elections as well. I understand that increasing rates as a political move as a political move is unpopular. But, however, we cannot make assumptions on the votes that were not returned. If we wish to, wish to make assumptions, we can only extrapolate out the percentages and we'd end up with the same result. Um, if Council asks either supporting or denying this recommendation based on a simple majority, we ask you to do the same for the respondents of this survey. Um, Allenbrook has a very active and enthusiastic local neighbourhood watch with about 5,500 members. Um, their aim is to combat crime and antisocial behaviour and look out for one another and make the community a safer and more secure place. The group members work very closely with the security patrol, especially if the patrol officers would join this group. We could give feedback direct... Sorry, is that... So the uh, Neighbourhood Watch group could give feedback directly to the uh, security company and... Uh, enable us to quickly respond. The security patrol would also ease, a, ease, the, burden, ease the burden on the police um, quite significantly by attending those lower pro priority incidents that police can't get to. 
We have a note from the police officer in charge at Ellenbrook as well. He said thank you for the opportunity to make a comment surrounding Ellenbrook security patrols. He can see some great benefits in the program and is prepared to work with the business practices with the, um, the security company. Certainly from a policing point of view, he'd be looking to set up a strong um, line of communication between Neighbourhood Watch, the security patrols and himself, capture feedback of areas of concerns and validate the observations if they are actually you know, warrant police attendance. The benefit of having a security patrol is they can capture the evidence um, for the police as well, so while the police are off attending other duties. For many residents, um, having the security patrol in place uh, a few years back was the reason that they purchased in Ellenbrook, myself included. I've been in Ellenbrook for 10 and a half years. Um, the fact that the majority of respondents voted in favour um, would be what we are putting forward as what we base the decision to reinstate this on. This was also the fact in the previous survey, although being a marginal majority, was still the majority wanted this service reinstated. That was ignored oh, yeah, because it was probably a, a minority or a, a marginal um, majority. Now that, I believe, would have contributed to the response rate for this as well. Interestingly enough, uh, there were around 500 more forms sent out this time around and you got 300 more back. So, you know, we can make assumptions of who, who responded and who didn't, but you know, it was interesting that we got 300 more back this time. Some crime stats in terms of home burglary, stealing, violence, theft, damage and uh, car, car thefts. Interestingly, when the violence reinstated theirs, they had a 29% decrease in, cr in crime for those particular items, down to three and a half offences per 1,000 people from 4.9. Allenbrook crime statistics went up after the cessation of the last security patrols by 14% to 75 offences per thousand for those those same type of offences. I'm happy to leave a copy with this so you can fact check this. You've got 30 seconds left, Mr Hayes. Sorry. Um, basically, I've looked at the respondents that have come back and they said they didn't want the service. All of these things can be addressed under the competitive tender process around cost. Cost point, if we um, got the company that's currently doing the vines, their cost point should probably come down if we extended their contract. I don't know who they are, but yeah, that's why it usually works. Volume discounts. Um, we can also put KPIs in place to uh, monitor the integrity of the service, which is largely what people are whinging about as well, saying that guys are sleeping on the job and things like that. There are income monitoring and stuff like that you can do, um, and things that we can you know, sort out via the, the competitive tender process. So. We would like to um, urge you cons to consider option two, which is reinstatement of the service. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hayes. You. Any questions of Mr. Hayes, councillors? No. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Thank you. Okay, next is item uh, 2.2, the proposed Brockman House Community Centre 15% schematic design, and our first speaker is Ms. Rosina Mastranelbo. Thank you, Ms. Eldro, Ms. Mastronelbo, and you have five minutes. Um, thank you for hearing me today. Um, my name is Jenny Burnside. Um, I am the chairperson from Brockman Community House. Um, so Brockman Community House is a not-for-profit neighbourhood centre located in Beachboro, um, who have been supporting and empowering the Altone area for 34 years. The community support program offers services and activities such as regular community events, adult education, leisure and fitness and wellbeing programs, parenting and early years programs and support, playgroups, creche, uh, counselling services, employment support, volunteer opportunities, technology support, food assistance and transport services. Uh, complemented on site by um, on site affordable children's services which provides long day care, outside school hours care, vacation care programs and free uh, child health nurse services. To ensure a healthy and inclusive and empowered community is achieved to its maximum potential, Brockman Community House endeavours to provide the community with free or low costing and easy to access opportunities to reduce social isolation, learn new skills, successfully manage health and wellbeing and gain confidence to manage everyday challenges. Brockman Community House is a unique and valuable entity which is well established in the Beachboro area, uh, continuing to embed a sense of belonging and familiarity to the community over the past 34 years. 
we have we have pages of signatures from local residents who agree that Brockham Community House is a well-respected pillar of the community and who agree with the proposed location of the new centre on Hull Park. So the current building that we're in now is no longer suitable. Um, it's no longer fit for purpose as it is in constant need of repair and maintenance. The rooms are too small and no longer facilitate the larger groups of people who need to use our services on a weekly basis. Our childcare and outside school hours care offers 70 places which are often fully booked or have very limited um, availability. The demand for childcare has continued to increase despite a new childcare facility next door. Um, also, the building no longer meets the current standards under the National Construction Code, Disability Discrimination Act or the Australian Standards for Universal Access. Brooklyn Community House Services have continued to expand over the past three decades. Um, originally, services included family support programs and childcare. We now offer community support program, childcare, outside school hours care, uh, vacation care program and child health services. Um, it's beneficial to the community for our services to grow and be adequately responsive to the population's evolving community trends and demographics. After over 15 years of trying to secure funding for a new Brockman House facility, we've finally secured $5 million through the state government. This would not have been achievable without the long um, without the long and standing commitment and support of the Altone community, Brockman House management and staff team, local and state government supporters. We sought community support for an election commitment of $5 million state funding um, towards the development of the new purpose-built facility to home Brockman House. The location was and has always been at Hull Park. This was evidently supported with over 200 community members signing a petition in favour. And this is a long, um, this is an exciting and long awaited opportunity to continue and expand services that support and benefit community development. By changing location or delaying the project in any way, we'll take away value from what, um, what could be developed. Uh, the City of Swan has identified that the northwestern corner of Hull Park is the proposed site, as this will have the least amount of impact to the community while still being able to provide appropriate services. To consider other sites would increase the delays with timing, push the project budget over the $5 million, which would be detrimental to the end result as there would be a need for more planning, architecture, uh, community consultations and more meetings and decisions, uh, which could result in only being able to afford a smaller building, which will not meet the needs of the service. Plus any delays would add to the already 15 years of waiting for a new building. I understand that several res residents around Hull Park uh, Small Street and Hallway have expressed their concerns. Um, so being inconvenienced by the construction, the benefits of the centre will outweigh a short-term construction noise. Rosine, you've got 30 seconds left. Ah. Um, increased, traf incre increased traffic on Small Street. Um, there's another access point on Altone Road. Uh, position and location. The proposed site has been identified by the City of Swan due to the flat area, the least number of trees that need to be located. Um, and the access that would provide it the least amount of disruption. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for your time and hearing me today. Thank you, Rosina. Councillors, any questions? None? Thank you, Rosina. Oh, Councillor Coley. Thank you. Jenny, is it? Yes. Rosina. Yeah, Jenny, thank you very much for the deputation and congratulations on all the great work you do in Brockman House. Um, I'm interested in and, and thank you for explaining a little bit more about why you're concerned about it being it should that it should go ahead in Hull Park. Um, I'm concerned if if uh, we went back a number of years and you had the opportunity to look at for other sites, would it be a, uh, would it have been an option back then to uh, move to somewhere else close by, or is it? It seems to me as a councillor who's only been on council two years, it's always been Hull Park, and there's never been another site considered. Um, my concern is with the objectors in respect of people losing the amenity in the area. Um, we lose some of that public open space. And um, so I'm just concerned, have you an objection to it being somewhere else if we were like three years back in the process and it wouldn't delay it? Um, as, I guess, tenants of the building that we're currently in and as we will be tenants of the building proposed, um, 
it was always, we don't own the building. We won't be owning the building. It'll be the city of Swan that is going to own the building. So it would be up to them to decide where it would be. And as far as I know, there have been other suggested sites but um, and some other areas of Hull Park that have been considered, but the, um, the best option as far as City of Swan um, and their decision um, was in the northwestern corner. So you're saying to me that no other proposed site's been put to you or Brockman House at all? Not as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah, it has always been at Hull Park. So that's the only option you've been given to work with? Yep, and as tenants, of the building currently and proposed, um, we basically will go where we needed to go I and where we're told that. to go. Yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other further questions, councillors? Thank you. Next speaker on this item is Mr. Dave Kelly, MLA member for Bassendean, <coughs> speaking in support of the recommendation. And Mr. Kelly, you too have five minutes. There's no higher privileges in this chamber. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, you'll have to uh, give me, accept my apologies for not wearing a tie, Mr Mayor. I'm on leave, so <laughs> I understand the hallowed ground I'm, I'm in. Uh, look, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and speak on this uh, project. Uh, look, you've heard from um, uh, Ms Burnside the important work that Hull Park, that uh, Brockman House do, uh, so I won't go into that. But in my time as being the local MP, uh, I'm aware that this organisation is probably the most important social uh, service deliverer uh, in, uh, in that area. So uh, I've just been absolutely impressed by the work they do. I'm also aware that for a long time they've needed additional space. Their existing um, facilities are simply not acceptable. Uh, so prior to the last state election, I was approached by Brockman House and by the City of Swan uh, to try and get a funding commitment from the state government uh, to uh, secure $5 million uh, for a new centre for Brockman House. Getting $5 million from the state government at any time is not easy. But prior to the last election, I, got, I secured a commitment uh, from the then opposition for uh, $5 million for a new Brockman House. Now, at the time, there had been a feasibility study which had considered a number of different locations, including my recollection as far away uh, as uh, uh, Bennett Springs. Uh, the consensus from uh, the set city at the time was that Hull Park was the appropriate place. So as it turns out, then opposition is now the government. There is $5 million from the state government uh, on offer for this facility. Now, uh, there is a window of opportunity for this project to go ahead. As you've heard uh, from uh, the community group from Brockman House, they've been waiting 15 years for this. Uh, this project needs to get going. There is no guarantee. I, I've heard suggestions that it be located elsewhere, for example, on land adjacent to um, uh, Kiara College. That land is not available for this project. So if the City of Swan was to currently say, oh, we don't want it at Hull Park, we want it next to Kiara College, that would effectively kill the project. I've heard suggestions that we should now suspend uh, the current project uh, and negotiate with the shopping centre next door to Hull Park and that the funding should be conditional upon us getting concessions out of the shopping centre. Uh, if the, this project is put on hold, pending discussions with the shopping centre, that would effectively push this project off to the never-never. Uh, the state government has this money uh, in the budget now. Uh, it's a commitment for this term of government. Uh, I don't, as local member, I don't want to see this project die because now the City of Swan effectively no longer supports the project as it was, uh, as it was planned uh, four years ago. Uh, City of Swan um, came to the state government, or then opposition, asked for this money You've now spent a considerable amount of money uh, on the planning. You've come to a proposal which uh, is, is recommended. The commitment from the state government is for a finite five million. Uh, so if the council for some reason was to say you wanted to explore other options, do other planning, uh, you'd either have to fund that yourself or take it out of the five million. 
uh, and ultimately, if you do that, you then uh, write down the project. So a lot of things can change uh, in, uh, in life. Uh, there's a state election in uh, a little over a year's time. We all know no elections are certain. If there was to be a change of government, there is no guarantee that that $5 million would remain uh, under a new government. So I would simply urge councillors, uh, the City of Swan came to the state government to ask for this money for a new centre to be built on Hole Park. The community want it, the community group wants it. As local member, I've moved heaven and earth within the funding arrangements of the state government to get this money. I would simply urge you, don't put this project effectively back to square one by not accepting the recommendation that's currently on your agenda. If you think it's going to go... 30 seconds, Mr Kelly. Oh, sorry. OK. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll finish there. Thank you, Mr Kelly. Questions, councillors? Councillor Catalano, you're first. Yes, thanks for that. Um, I am actually concerned, though, um, about the um, congestion that already exists on Hull Way. Um, and that, um, you know, this is not relieving that um, and that actually... I just wondered what you thought about that. Well, I've, as you know, I'm the local MP. I've not had any issues from the local community raised with me in opposition to this centre on any on this project on on any issue, including uh, congestion. So I think with anything, you have to balance all the um, all the issues here. City of Swan have got five million dollars from the state government on the table to build a new Brockman House Centre. If you go in there, the Brockman House assists hundreds if not thousands of local residents every year and it's done so for 35 years. This centre will set them up for another 25 years probably. Uh, if there are some uh, traffic issues, I'm sure your professional planners here have taken that into account uh, in coming up with the project as it's, as it's planned. So. Um, I'd say listen to the professionals, but with any decision, you have to weigh up all the, the pros and cons, um, and I think this project is eminently supportable. Uh, if the state government ultimately doesn't fund uh, this project, the council is going to have to pay uh, for the renewal because it's your building. As you've heard, it doesn't meet current building standards. So it's just one of those things you have to consider. Thank you, Mr Kelly. Councillor Kyle, you got a question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Minister Kelly. I think that's more appropriate. Oh, look, you can call me, call me Dave, Dave, really. Thank you, Dave, Seriously. For coming in. I'm on leave. <laughs> I would have worn my tie otherwise. I, I'm just... It uh, puts us council, as a council in a difficult position because uh, with the Western Australian Planning Commission's Livable Neighbourhoods document, mm. we're supposed to provide 10% public open space, and mm. that, to my understanding, was provided when Beachboro was carved up, and... And, and we're now finding ourselves in a situation where we're having to um, allocate land mm. which is to provide amenity for the community mm. to be built on, to provide other mm. buildings. Uh, I'm interested to know from your perspective, mm. do you have mm. any obligation to mm. abide by the Liverpool Neighbourhoods document or the 10% um, public mm. open space or is that something we, you think we should override? Sure. Look, Councillor, as I said, um, this project was came to me from both the community group and from the City of Swan. The City of Swan looked at a whole range of sites uh, as part of that feasibility study. The site that the City advised me was the most suitable is the one on Hull Park. So it's not a question of me not abiding uh, by... Um, any particular policies. Council has to make a whole lot of decisions. You've got to weigh up a whole lot of uh, options. Uh, the, you know, it, my personal view is the location that's been chosen on Hull Park really uh, will limit the amenity of that region area in a very minor way, a very minor way. Uh, there'll still be a substantial park there at Hull Park. Uh, but you know, it's the site that was recommended by the city itself. Now, I take it, um, I accept that you weren't on council at the time, but City of Swan, I know, you know, 
Uh, if you're going to enter into long-term agreements with the state government around significant funding uh, of projects, you can't chop and change. It makes it really difficult. Every time people come to the state government seeking funding for a project, you need to know that the city is a reliable and long-term partner because if you don't, it's really difficult then to, to get things off the ground. So I appreciate the position that you're in, but I would say listen to the community around you in the ward that you represent. This is probably the most important organisation for delivering social services in that area and its current facilities are simply inadequate. You've got an opportunity to set them up for the next 25 years uh, and I just urge you to take it. Thank you, Mr Kelly. Thank you, Minister. I'm just, you mentioned there listening to the community. We've got a report in front of us now where the majority of uh, respondents have been object, objectors to the putting it on Hull Park. Um, so I do take on board what you're saying there in Sorry, respect of... Can I just ask you how many objectors uh, there were? I, there is, I believe, only 10 here that we've got in front of us, but it is our report on which we have to base our sure. um, decision upon. Um, I don't know from... We may be able to ask staff if there were further sure. submissions. Ca Councillor, I, I think you're also obliged to listen to what the rest of your community is saying, generally. Yeah. I think you just heard from the community organisation they've got a petition of 200 residents in support of the current location in Hull Park. I'd be interested to have a look at that. And okay, before we slide into debate, you've got another question, Councillor? I, I do, thank you, Mayor. I'd be interested in having a look at that petition and seeing how the question was posed. I'm just wondering, if we go down the path of using public open space to provide uh, public buildings, where, where does it stop? Uh, in 10 years, are we looking at another area of Hull Park to, to build another government building that, which could be provided elsewhere? Well, Councillor, hopefully Councilor, in 10 years you'll, Mr. Kelly can't answer, but you'll still be on council. You can make that decision in the future. <laughs> I doubt that very Hopefully much. I won't be the local member. <laughs> um, yes. I've just got a question for staff. Well, we'll do that after because I'm going to get Mr Russell to do a short presentation in a minute. So are there any further questions of Mr Kelly? In that case, thank you, Mr Kelly. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Sorry, we've written that one. Jim, have you got a few minutes to just give a brief over of this one and perhaps ask a couple of questions? I've allowed time for three questions, if we can. Um, Only a two-minute thing, the, three minutes. Oh, I think the report um, covers the, the issues and the speakers have covered the issues well. I'm um, happy to, to take any particular questions. I think perhaps in relation to the question that Councillor Kiley asked, there was ten submissions, eight of which objected, but there were letter drops done to 276 properties. So. Um, the, it was quite a small proportion of people who did reply. Um, yeah, and as has been mentioned, um, some, it's been a project that's been planned for um, many years. There's been a number of sites that have been identified and it's certainly come down to Hull Park being the, the, um, the preferred for a number of reasons. A number of locations have been looked at specifically on, on Hull Park. Three, I think, three different locations on Hull Park. There's been a lot of... Um, consultation with the um, Brockman House community group themselves, um, Jenny and her predecessors, in relation to to the location and, and um, their needs and the layout of the building, and the yeah, the, the recommendation is um, is the is the preferred option based on um, all of that feedback that's that's been received, and certainly as um, both speakers emphasised, the the um, the window to get this constructed is quite small, um, and. If there are changes to the design that's required, that um, or changes to location, that will put it back. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll push the project back considerably. We need, need necessary to redesign it and um, go to consultation again. Thanks, Jim. Sorry about that, Matt. I had that on the list for for Phil. Uh, Councillor Johnson, you got a question? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, My question is a councils. simple one. Um, may I ask what other locations other than Hull Park were considered? Mr. Cate. Oh, I don't have that information in front of me, but there were certainly, there were, as um, Minister Kelly said, certainly there was the location in Bennett Springs. I know there was some discussions about a range of other areas, um, Altone Park being an example. So there was a range of other of discussions, but I don't, don't have the exact details in front of me. Councillor Kiley, you got a question? Mayor, I find it quite unbelievable that uh, that the list of other sites would not be at hand that we've considered. I mean, 
considering three different areas on Hull Park is not you got a, a range of... Got a question? Could I ask um, that staff, through you, if I could, that staff provide that list of other locations? You certainly can, Mr Coat, and get them to him during the week. Yes, we can. I would also point out, through you, Mr Mayor, that the Hull Park site was a resolution of council to build it at the at previous you. time this came to council. Thank council you. directed staff to build it at Hull Park. I think just, you were the mover of that motion too, by the way, Councillor Coley. No, Mayor, you're completely wrong. In respect of looking at the 15%, I was, but not in, in respect of the location. Okay, have you got one more but, question? Because I've allowed three questions yeah, from Mr uh, Coton. So, have you got another one? Uh, the other question is, we heard that um, from Minister Kelly that the idea of it being put on hold, seeking concessions with shopping centres, the shopping centre. I'm just interested if, if staff could elaborate on that information. I hadn't heard anything in respect of that. I don't think the staff are doing it at this point in time. There was a suggestion from, from other parties. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, um, any further questions, Jim, you can email him during the week prior to next week's council meeting. Okay, next is um, 3.1, which is the adoption of Amendment 150 for the local planning scheme number 17 to replace additional use of number 36 with industry general bitumen processing on lot 16, number 1392 and lot 32, oh, sorry, lot 32, number 1398 Great Northern Highway, Upper Swan. We have three speakers and one of them is representing the Upper Swan Ratepayers Association. The first one is Ms Patsy Malloy speaking against the recommendation. Ms Malloy, if you come to the microphone. And Ms Malloy, you have five minutes. Thank you. In 1929, my grandparents bought Lot 1 Nolan Avenue, Upper Swan from Mrs Nolan. I live on that property. The 1898 Health Act established boards to oversee public health, including noxious industries, and the collection of rates on land to pay for the management of sewerage, rubbish and maintain clean waterways. Councils were established to protect public health and ensure clean air and water at a local level. Now we have the EPA Act. We can scientifically measure the components of noxious odours from bitumen plants, which include PAHs, hazardous air pollutants, HAPs, including toluene, benzene, naphthalene, formaldehyde, phenyl, styrene, xylene, among others. Not that the proponents' odour report included any specific scientific analysis of their emissions, the inadequacy of which defies belief. It is my understanding that this is a prescribed premises category, category 36 under the EPA regulations of 1987. There is no detail as to the chemical composition of the polymer blends being produced on the site. I thoroughly support the points that will be raised in the Upper Swan District Ratepayers and Residents Association Incorporated submission concerning the fugitive emissions from trucks and the multiple repeated reports of uncontrolled emissions from the facility by surrounding residents. This is evidence of the escape of hazardous materials from this facility. We also have methods of monitoring and filtering systems if they are in place. However, according to the proponent, they've been conducting this operation since 2012 despite no licence to conduct the business. Therefore, there has been no monitoring, regulation or control of this industry. The City of Swan report presented to uh, councillors contains a health department submission that states no objection as long as the guidelines are adhered to. The guidelines for bitumen manufacture are a one kilometre buffer zone. We also have planning acts and regulations including the Swan Valley Planning Act so we don't get inconsistencies in planning like building a bitumen plant in the middle of a residential area. If the guideline for prescribed industries was adhered to, this project would impinge on the Swan Valley. In fact, the proposed Satterley residential development, including schools, shops, etc., will bring in approximately 1,600 new residents within the buffer zone. I've seen documents obtained under Freedom of Information that contain formal letters of warning and notification of breaches of building permits, environmental compliance and, more recently, fire regulations. Part of my submission included information from a Queensland WorkSafe report, an audit of bitumen and asphalt plants following three serious explosions and fires, which discovered that 37% weren't able to identify the flash point, auto-ignition point 
or maximum heating temperature for all bitumen-related product stores on the site. However, they did have documented evacuation plans. These were noticeably lacking in the disastrous fire in Bellevue in the 1990s in the city of Swan, the recent fire at the recycling facility in South Guildford in December 2019 was uncontrolled for four hours and exposed residents to plumes of toxic smoke containing burning plastics. Given the history of non-compliance and incapacity to address these reasonable concerns, how secure are you, councillors, that this facility is safe from fire? So on, um, I'd like to ask the following questions. Besides supporting the deputation from the Upper Swan District Ratepayers and Residents Association, has the City of Swan notified FISA of the fire risks? Has the City of Swan worked with FISA to prepare an evacuation plan for residents in case of emergency, including how to deal with the blockage of Great Northern Highway, which occurred when one of these trucks fell off its, um, its thing and blocked the whole highway? If we had a fire at the facility, a bushfire approaching on the riparian zone, which is bushfire prone... 30 seconds left, Miss Molly. Pardon? 30 seconds left. All right. Whether the city of anyway, and what's the city of Swan's responsibility to new residents buying land in the proposed Satterley development in the Upper Swan town site? Whether the city of Swan decides to accept an amendment to the zoning or not, I am aware of the um, developmental approval breaches notified to the industry dated the 18th of April 2017 to take action to stop blending, mixing, or heating of bitumen-related products. Condition two: Will the city of Swan Thank you, follow up? On their letters, would well. I'll just reiterate, Councillor. Ms. Malloy is reading the questions, which we already agreed at the start to take on notice, and those answers will be in the agenda next Wednesday. Am I correct, Ms. Malloy? I we, guess we so. To, yeah. Okay. So that's that's yours. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, don't go yet. Come back. Come back. We're not letting you off that easy. <laughs> Councillors, any questions of Ms. Malloy? Councillor Kiley. Uh, Patsy, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to reading the answers to those questions when we get them. Um, I'm interested in the 18th of April 2017 when there was, a, I believe, the cease and desist of the batching or the heating of the, the bitumen. Um, I was up there on Sunday and uh, spoke to some residents who said, no, we haven't smelt the uh, bitumen for a while, and I thought the problem had maybe gone away, but obviously there's a cease and desist uh, order that had stopped the batching and therefore the problem maybe have gone away. But um, w when, it was, when they were batching it there, how bad was the problem, basically? Well, my, it's my understanding, and the, the um, Upper Swan District ratepayers have a lot more information. There have been at least uh, 51 complaints of odours specifically relating to bitumen-related products between uh, 2017 and 2019. And in fact, when these um, m reports have been prepared from DEWA specifically, the proponent told them why are you worried about it now, we've been doing it since 2012. And when he was asked a question uh, by um, the Honourable Jessica Shaw about um, the issue, he said, well, we're not heating it in the actual um, site anymore. We're driving the trucks to the road train assembly area and heating our bitumen there, which is, to me, a totally inadequate response. You're not... I mean... If Well, it defies logic, quite frankly. I know that it's very complicated, that we have planning and health acts and environmental acts that work against each other, but if they work against each other, to the extent at which no monitoring has been undertaken, we've got a report that shows um, uh, hydrocarbons on the ground and pictures of them washing down their heating equipment from trucks with kerosene into cut-down plastic IBCs on a pallet on the ground, not even sealed, not even sealing their own uh, facility. It, it just... It's in the middle of opposite gingers and in the middle of the town site where you're planning, planning to have 1,600 fa people, families moving in. I mean, the fact is, with this sort of... If you've got heavy um, gases falling out of the air and, and people are reporting them in their homes and so on, 
when children play with the dirt, they actually ingest per pound of body weight more of um, pollutants because they eat dirt. I mean, it, you know, there are Thank studies. You, I think you've been... answered, Councillor Collins. Oh, questions. sorry. Thanks. Any further questions of Mr. Malloy? Councillor Johnson. Oh, sorry, Councillor Henderson. Sorry, my apologies. Thank you, Mayor. It's that resemblance. Um, um, yes, Patsy, uh, during your presentation, you referred to bitumen manufacture. Um, I just want to be clear about if it's if it's manufacture or if it's blending, because the bitumen, I think, is actually manufactured in Qdale, So Yes, but the blending of polymers into the bitumen is occurring. Well, it's reportedly not occurring, but by the smell appears to be still occurring. Mm. And by certain statements of the proponents, seems to still be occurring. There are trucks coming and going. Presumably they're doing something with bitumen and tanks. And that the whole purpose of the facility is to mix the polymer blends, yeah. according to the uh, reports. Yeah. Thank you. That they sent. Councillor Congerton, you're next. Thank you. Um, Ms. Holly, you, can you confirm that you're unaware of any washed down containment on site? Well, the pictures that were part of um, the submission, I think there's a 19 page to um, show a cut down IBC with heating um, elements being washed down into the cut down plastic container on a, on a pallet, it appears. So that's how they clean their heating things out of the trucks. So that will contain bitumen residue and all of the chemicals that I mentioned. Any other questions, councillors? Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Uh, sorry, one more, Councillor Perry. Oh, hang on, Mr. Russell's going to do something. Now. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker on this is either Ms. Sharon or Mr. Jeff Smith. And I would assume you're Mr. Jeff Smith. Yes, I am. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Smith. You too have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors. Um, we wish to object to the Amendment 150 under the Local Planning Scheme 7A. Uh, many of the objections you've heard already and will continue to hear um, relate to the management of the noise and odours and the other things there. What we wanted to talk about was the environmental consequences that need to be addressed. Uh, bitumen bl blending runs a high risk of pollution to soil and water. The subject site is 800 metres from the Swan River and within the Kondari Swamp rehabil rehabil <laughs> excuse me, Rehabilitation Site and with and the Ellenbrook Bullsbrook conversation, uh, Conservation Area. The site is also within the 100 year floodplain and its area of high acid sulphate soil risk. These soils can react with oxygen and produce sulfuric acid, which can weaken concrete, iron, steel, and aluminium alloys. All of the applicants' bitumen storage towers are situated within this high soil risk area. In 2009, an application for, the bitumen, uh, for a bitumen blending facility in Maddington resulted in the EPA formally assessing the project after appeals from residents. Uh, the subject site in the situation was already zoned industry, which this isn't. Ultimately, the City of Gosnells resolved not to approve due to it being within the 1,000 metre buffer area mentioned earlier by the EPA. Uh, an industry report compiled for the New South Wales Government in 2001 reported that an audit of 17 licensed bitumen sites in the state showed that 82% had issues with storage of hydrocarbons and other chemicals, 76% had issues with the management of water waste and stormwater runoff, 64% had issues with the delivery and handling of the bitumen, diesel and other chemicals. This shows a major failure relating to uh, the pollution and possible contamination regardless of the health implications. Environmental reports have addressed the controlling of potential pollutants but a Again, this relies on human intervention and correct handling procedures, which we're not sure are happening, of course. Pollution has previously been found on the site. Has there been any water or soil testing to determine if any damage has already been done to the surrounding areas? At the very least, the council or the EPA should arrange for an independent study to be done, not one paid for by Bitchatech. The applicant's continual lack of diligence in the past does not build confidence that the environment can be protected. 
Bitumen is a class 2B substance, which is carcinogenic to humans. Polybuilt 106, which is the polymer blend they use um, to heat, blend and mix bitumen, contains vinyl acetate. Vinyl acetate is a 2B substance, carcinogenic to humans. Uh, according to WHO, the short-term exposure to fumes caused, uh, causes eye and respiratory irritation. Long-term are carcinogenic to humans. Council needs to consider, is this an industry or should it be classified as... Is it really general industry or should it be cla classified as noxious? The potential rezoning of this land also sets a precedent for the future. Uh, note a comment from a City of Swan staff. If Amendment 150 was approved by Council, Minister and WAPC and comes into effect, a landowner can therefore lodge a planning application for activities specified in that additional use. The property located at 1 Copley Street is for sale, next door to the Bitch Tech. It's less than 300 metres from the subject site and is being advertised as a nearby property applying for general industry zoning, i.e. trying to raise the price of their property. I ask all councillors to ask themselves one simple question. Would you be comfortable with a bitumen blending plant in your or next to your home? With over 70 objections to the proposal, I'm sure the majority, of, um, the majority should take precedence over the minority and this business scenario. That's all. Thank you, Mr Smith. Questions, councillors? None. Thank you, Mr Smith. Okay, next up on this one is Ms Leanne Fried, the chairperson on behalf of the Upper Swan Districts Ratepayers and Residents Association speaking against the recommendation. Now, Ms Fried is speaking for a large group of people, so I've allowed for her to speak for 10 minutes. So, Ms Fried, you can take your time and give it your best shot. Thank you. Thank you. We of the Upper Swan District Ratepayers and Residents Association are opposed to replacing the existing additional use no number 36 with additional use industry general on lot 16 and lot 32 Great Northern Highway Upper Swan. Our concerns relate to the proximity of the above lots to residential and sensitive areas leading to the potential for social, environmental and economic harm. Now I'll outline our main concerns which are expanded on in a document sent to the councillors. Firstly, we can concerned about air quality and pollution. Pollutant emissions come from a number of point so, uh, sources um, at a bitumen facility, and it is the cumulative effect that is the most concerning. According to Bitchetech's odour assessment by in NVAL in 2017, the principal odour emissions will be during bitumen and bitumen product transfers, as vapours in the headspace above the receiving tanks are displaced by the incoming um, liquid, and also from periodic opening of the hopper to manually load polymer. The plant may operate for up to 10 hours per day. Loading and unloading operations could be up to an hour per day. The operator estimates on average approximately 10, uh, 25 truck movements per day, Approximately one tr uh, truck movement per, da per day will be a delivery of bitumen. The cumulative effect of these transfers may result in residents being affected by bitumen emissions for more than three hours during a 24-hour period once the emulsion and polymer plants are operational. Enval's conclusion from their odour assessment report is that their modelling showed a PMB plant will not cause the EPA's residential odour criteria to be exceeded at any residences. However, the reality is that to date, Bichichek, operating as merely a transport facility, has produced emissions detectable up to 750 metres from the site. And according to DEWA uh, records, residents submitted 51 odour complaints between the 1st of August 2017 and 8th of April 2019 and there are no doubt many more people affected that haven't complained. In addition, Enval's report used the present maximum um, allowed volume of bitumen and, bit and bitumen emulsion stored on the site of 220 kilolitres. The proposed rezoning increases the amount to 300 kilolitres and the modelling of emissions needs to be projected to the future output, not based on the current output. We also consider that Bichichek's field odour assessment was inadequate and flawed in process. The assessment was conducted on a single day over a 2.25 hour period in very light to light winds. Not surprisingly, it did not detect any odour. So we are concerned about the potential health impacts on residents. Some occupants have been forced to keep windows shut and many outdoor pursuits have been curtailed. 
According to the report prepared by Aurora Environmental in 2017, bitumen is classified as possibly carcinogenic to humans and that downward resi downwind residents may be affected by toxic gases. Exposure to fumes may cause adverse human impacts including irritation, redness of, or pain to eyes, dermatitis and photosensitisation to the skin, and, and inhalation of fumes may cause headache, nausea and respiratory tract irritation. Not only is the air in the upper swamp being polluted by emissions from existing bitumen operations, it is also being polluted by diesel and petrol fumes from the roadhouses, increased through traffic emissions, dust from the extraction of clay, and pollution from the proliferation of transport depots on the, on the eastern side of the highway. We are concerned about the combined effect of these various forms of pollution on resident health. And in its discussion paper, the Health Impact Assessment in WA in 2007, the Western Australian Government Department of Health stated, localised proposals that individually may only affect a small proportion of the community, but when combined with others in a region could result in significant health outcomes, need mechanisms to provide for assessments of cumulative impacts. We request a health impact assessment be undertaken for the residential area west of Great Northern Highway in Upper Swan. And the assessment should include monitoring of environmental polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon levels. We're also um, uh, concerned about the risk of environmental harm, as has already been spoken about, to the, uh, to the adjacent Kundari Swamp and Swan River wet wetlands. The risk to the wetlands from unauthorised discharges is very real, given the history of non-compliance previously de demonstrated by Bitutech. The facilities operators have shown a gross disregard for de development approval conditions. We are aware Bitutech has committed numerous breaches of conditions, including construction of the workshop and tank farm without a building permit and storage tanks built higher than approved plans. More seriously, in 2017, the company was found to be in breach of condition two and condition four when it was confirmed there was a bitumen manufacturing facility present, which had not been approved by the DWA or by the city of Swan. In addition, a DWA document on environmental compliance dated uh, August 2017 contains photographs of tru trucks washed on unsealed ground, a heated truck filter cleaning system washed on unsealed ground, a truck hose filter cleaning station appears to comprise just a 44-gallon drum standing on an open slatted wooden pallet on unsealed ground, and there's hydrocarbon stains on unsealed ground and runoff activity um, of washing trucks. Given that Bitutech's original stormwater plan was a pipe through the, f through the fence onto Borrell's land and that no baseline monitoring of groundwater quality has been undertaken, taken, Monitoring groundwater on this site and surrounding properties is urgently required. We consider it vital to protect our wetlands from dangerous degradation. In addition, a valuable nature conservation and recreation area is to be established when extraction of clay is completed by Borrell on the site adjacent to the Bitutech site. It would be highly undesirable to have a bitumen plant next to such a valuable community resource. As already spoken about, bushfire um, is a threat and potential accidents at the site place the Upper Swan community at risk. The site, the Bitutech site is approximately 200 metres from a designated bushfire prone area and opposite a very busy, busy roadhouse that supplies bulk fuel. Recent images of out of control bushfires near Yanship and Collie and in the eastern states are graphic reminders of what is possible in the rural fringes of the metropolitan area. In 2017, a bushfire at Brigadoon came within approximately 1.5 kilometres from the upper um, Swan Town site, and burning embers had started spot fires up to 150 metres ahead of the blaze. Uh, and on the th uh, 13th of January two, uh, 2020, Swan Valley and Regional Networks reported a drone bushfire threat in Brigadoon involving parachute flares launched from the Brigadoon and Avon Ridge, Ridge car park. Risk from fire is real. On the 9th of April 2019, Bitutech were advised by the city that the property does not comply with the city's fire break notice with regards to building protection zones, with leaves on roofs and gutters and large trees fringing the site. These trees have been retained to reduce the visual impact from the street, proving that this major industrial operation is visually unacceptable in the Swan Valley region and is also a fire hazard. 
there are also far re uh, risks inherent in the actual operation of, of a bitumen facility from bitumen leakages, eruptions or boilovers. Local governments and DIY are hard pressed to inspect licensed premises and the proponent has shown a disregard in the past for the maintenance of regulations. Historic historically, the City of Swan has repeatedly stated that rezoning of the site is undesirable. In the words of the Swan City Council in 1997, rezoning of the site to general industry would set an undesirable precedent for further spot rezoning in Upper Swan and lead to ribbon development. In 2017, the City of Swan's planning officer said spot rezoning would only be supportive if it was of special or urgent nature and if the development would not adversely affect surrounding areas. We consider the application is not of special or urgent nature and would most certainly adversely affect the Upper Swan community. Rezoning the site ignores the current northeast planning framework which seeks to place industrial activities to the south of Bullsbrook and clearly identifies the existing residential area directly west of the Bitchin manufacturing site as urban. Rezoning the site also disregards the Swan City's rural planning strategy, which requires the preparation of a strategic master plan to guide land use in the Upper Swan ta town site. We consider any rezoning of sites in Upper Swan should not occur until a strategic master plan is in place. This master plan needs to take into consideration planned residential developments, such as west of the train line. If this, if this proposal is passed, congestion along Great Northern Highway may also become an issue with an increased number of trucks entering per day. Over, yeah, a, frontage, 30 seconds left, Ms. over a frontage of 320 metres, there are now three transfer depots, all with access on a major state highway with a speed limit of 80 um, kilometres per hour. Uh, the, the City of Swan is one of the fastest growing local authorities and the growth will generate more traffic on its arterial roads. Although some traffic will, will, a reduction will, will occur with, when the North Link project is complete, sand and clay extraction and broad acre residential developments in the vicinity will see hundreds of trucks using Great Northern Highway um, daily. So in Thank you, Ms. Wright. In conclusion, we, we will say that we um, are adamantly opposed and we thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Henderson. Oh, uh, well. Okay. Um, questions, councillors? Uh, thank you, Ms. Wright, for that presentation. Question of staff, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Russell's just going to do a quick overview and then I'll take three questions from Mr. Russell after that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just want to comment on this three questions business. Um, there's 15 councillors here. We might all have a question. I know. I'm talking about three questions on Mr. Russell's presentation. That's slightly different. So I just want to get him out of that way. But you can ask your question now if you wish, if you've got it ready. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. But he might um, answer in his presentation. My question relates to uh, grounds for opposing this. Um, is it lawful for council to consider past environmental performance? As a, as a ground for rejecting this, thinking ahead to what may happen if it ended up in SAT. Mr Russell? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, I'll need to make clear to Council that what you understand about reasons for exercising judgment or discretion on a planning application is very different to a scheme amendment. Scheme amendment proposals are not subject to judicial review in Western Australia, and the tests that apply to scheme amendment considerations are different to development applications. The Council can, and, and well, what the Council is charged to do with this instrument in front of it at the present time is it has to consider the submissions made, all submissions made on this amendment, and decide on the basis of those submissions whether or not it wishes to advance support of the amendment, modify the amendment in some way, or reject the amendment for those reasons. So in short, any of these reasons, if the Council has concerns around the environment, public health or anything else, the Council can legitimately advance those as a reason in opposition to this amendment next week when it is called upon to decide its position. And that becomes a recommendation, Mr Mayor, to the Minister. I think that's a yes, Councillor. OK, Mr Russell, if I know we've covered a fair bit. If there's any further overview you'd like to add to that? To this item? Uh, just one thing, Mr Mayor, and I think it, it's important to note. The information presented here and the speakers have suggested that these proponents are in breach 
of uh, they're, they're conducting what is a prescribed premises that requires a work approval without a licence. And you've heard these speakers talk very much and quite legitimately, and I appreciate their concern, around issues of environmental impact and public health. Another speaker correctly identified that in this state we have an Environmental Protection Act and an Environmental Protection Authority and a government apparatus called the Department of Environment Regulation that is charged under legislation for regulating these things. And I would simply say that if, they, if there is, if they, and some of this material seems to have been taken FOI from the Department of Environment, I would simply say to the council and to these affected <coughs> members, have they taken that issue up with the, uh, with the government? Have they taken that issue up with the Director General of this department and asked the question as to what capacity the regulator has to take action for if they're contending here, or there's evidence of a clear breach, what they're doing about it. Because it's important, Mr Mayor, to note that agency, those agencies, are the ones charged with the responsibility for regulating these sorts of activities, not principally the council of a local government that doesn't have the expertise necessarily nor, nor, nor the capacity to regulate environmental aspects charged under that legislation. I'll just make that point, Mr Mayor. Councillors, um, on, on basis of what Mr Rush said now, Councillor Perry, you already had a question? Yeah, I had a uh, question to staff, Mr Mayor. Yep. Um, can staff please advise what's the difference between bitumen manufacturing to bitumen processing, please? Mr Russell. For the purposes of our planning scheme, Mr Mayor, there is no difference. The words talk about manufacture, the words talk about processing, altering, etc. The English language words comprised in the scheme definition make no differentiation between processing, being heating, or chemically manufacture or anything else. It's all the same as far as our scheme is concerned in terms of the definition of industry. Thank you, Mr Russell. Councillor Councillor Kiley. Mayor, I'm interested in the concept of an auth being an authorised authority, that being the City of Swan being an authorised authority under uh, other um, Acts of Parliament to investigate reports of uh, noxious fumes and the like or ba uh, batching inappropriately in a, um, or, or spills onto the ground. I mean, aren't we as a council authorised to go in and investigate those incidents? Questions of staff, more likely. Mr Russell. It's a Planning and Development Act, Mr Mayor. There, there is the uh, Health Act of 1911, which is, as you know, dates from the Edwardian era and doesn't necessarily correspond with a lot of the modern concepts of, uh, of industrial activity. Uh, we have investigated and did investigate, as, and as has been made clear, issued notices for breach for processing, specifically heating the bitumen as a breach of the Planning and Development Act. Planning and Development Act, and there's no conditions regulating uh, the, um, uh, the, the um, wash down or other details with respect to, to the, uh, um, the transport depot or the bitumen. So there is, to some extent, powers, but the point I made earlier on is the principal powers, the principal remit, the principal legislation and authority that governs these things on a prescribed premises is the agency I've just named. And I don't know, to be fair, maybe action has been taken, maybe, activi uh, maybe action has been taken. But it is important to note that the city has only limited powers under, it, under the legislation that it, that it uh, implements, and it doesn't implement the Environmental Protection Act. It does, uh, and works approvals and licences made pursuant to it. Our powers do not, Mr Mayor, do not extend under that legislation. Thank you, Mr Russell. You have Follow question, question. Colley? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'm interested in who then issued the cease and desist um, direction uh, back in August 2000, April 2017. Was it the EPA or was it the City of Swan and for what reasons? Well, I think Mr Russell stated earlier that they were in breach of their current DA, taking up a practice that's not approval and therefore they were issued with a cease and desist. Uh, in respect of the answer given by Mr. Russell, Mayor, he referred to powers that we have and we have and may not have. Obviously, we do have certain powers. I'm interested to see um, on what basis we issued the cease and desist. 
because they were carrying out an activity that which is in clear breach of what approvals they currently had, as we would do with any other industry or any other person that was carrying out an activity which they did not have planning approval for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carolina, you got a question? Um, yes. I, I actually am finding it difficult to understand what the conditions are um, if this is approved. I mean, in terms of noxious odours and um, uh, the amenity on the community, are there any conditions on that? If this is approved? Um, Mr so Russell? Thank, thank you, Mr Mayor. I think it's important to note here this is a pro process where this is at. The Council has to consider the submissions made on this amendment decide whether it wants to recommend that this amendment be supported by the Minister for Planning. Even if, hypothetically, the Minister for Planning decides that it can support this amendment, then the next step is Bichitech will need to lodge a development application for the blending, manufacture, processing, whatever you want to call it, of the bitumen facility, a development application. Without uh, foreshadowing an answer to the questions that we've taken on notice, it is at the DA stage, if it advances, that the city, the council, in considering an application, can decide whether it refers it to the EPA, refers it back to Dewar, refers it to FISA, refers it to anyone else that the Council might consider it prudent or to be helped in its decision-making and exercising discretion on a development application, whether or not it's appropriate, including safe and healthy, to approve. So all of, those, all, all of that capacity, we're not at that stage at this point. It's a two-step process. They need to get a tick off from the Minister. They need to get then, if the Minister ticks it off, a development application ticked off by this council. So all of these things, it's, it's, this, is, this is a preliminary process that dictates whether they even get to the opportunity of lodging a development application for a bitumen processing plant. And then, even if they do get that, they still need to get a works approval and a licence, which I can assure you is far more technical and restrictive on environmental conditions than the development approval, as you would imagine, for the reasons I've already outlined. So there's a whole net of regulatory approvals these punters have to get, to use the analogy, to operate properly under the legislation. And this is only an aspect of the planning side <coughs> of things, and then there's a further planning side of things, and then, even if there's all of that, there's the environmental approvals they'll still need to get. So there's a long way to go, and assuredly, all of these concerns, if the council sees fit to pass it, okay, will still need to be addressed and can be addressed in detail at the development application stage if the council's of a mind to support it. And even if the council's of a mind, the Honourable Minister for Planning must also be prepared to accept the amendment. Thank you, Mr Russell. Any further questions, councillors? Councillor Kiley. A uh, question through you, Mayor. I was interested in uh, Satterley. Were any representatives for Satterley uh, interested in speaking tonight, or d were they told of this uh, application? Were they made like aware of the else, application? I thought like everybody else, council, if they were interested, they would have been here. Were the, so, oh, just a quick: were they included in the uh, residences or the land being notified about the application? That's a question to staff. Mr. Russell, would that notification have gone them, to your knowledge? I don't know, Mr Mayor, but what I can say is that uh, uh, under the law, the legislation requires us to advertise the, uh, this amendment through a notice in a metropolitan circulating paper. So the question is whether that's sufficient for Satterley to, to uh, be informed. I'll have to check on the things there, whether they were directly notified, but certainly uh, um, they're not here tonight making a submission. I would have thought that a major land developer would be pretty aware of what's going on in their uh, region. Mayor, if you wouldn't mind, I'd be interested in ensuring that Satterley were notified of this application and... and Excuse uh, me. I'm sorry, I, just one moment. Yeah, we've I can answer that. <laughs> you are sorry. No, I spoke to Satterley on Sunday at the Clementine launch of Upper Swan and they didn't know about this. Okay, um, this thank is you. Amy, who's in charge of the thank you. overseeing... I'm sure someone in their office will fail that. Councillor Colley, give me a ring. OK, any further questions, councillors? Yeah, Council Mayor, if I can, just to follow on, I'd be interested to know if that's reasons for a, a uh, refusal, given the 
the investments that are putting into the area? I would say no. I or wouldn't think so. Or a I wouldn't think so. They'd be up there. The okay, there you go. Thank you. Thank Councillor you. Henderson, you have a question? Thank you. Thank you. We will follow that. Councillor Henderson, you had a question? Uh, thank you. Uh, did the uh, I notice uh, there were people speaking against that. The, the, did the applicant uh, ask to do a submission tonight? No. Okay. Thank you, councillors. Any other questions? No. In that case, councillors will now move on to item uh, three point two was the final adoption of amendment number one seven one to local planning scheme number seventeen to insert caravan park as an additional use on part lot 800-168 Morrissey Road, Bullsbrook, and Mr Dan Pearce from Roberts Day. Thank you, Mr Mayor, councillors and staff. Um, appreciative of your time this, this evening and that you have a very heavy agenda. We'll keep our comments brief. Um, firstly, we'd just like to thank the staff for working with us through to achieve this um, recommendation for support that's before you. The matter has been before council previously and tonight we think the officer recommendation sets it out very well. We'd just like to note our support for the recommendation for option one um, and request that council uh, support that and progress the matter on to the WAPC for consideration. Uh, the only other thing I would like to say this evening is that we are available to answer any questions if um, elected members have queries in relation to the proposal and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Pearce. Any questions, councillors? Councillor Catalano. Yes, thank you. Um, I noticed that there's quite a bit of uh, bush clearing for the caravan park. And I was wondering, have you undertaken a threatened ecological communities survey to ascertain whether any of that bushland is a threatened ecological community? Thank you, Councillor. I can answer that. Um, at the moment, the proposal is merely for the permissibility to use the land for a caravan park. Um, so surveys were undertaken and there weren't any um, sort of threatened ecological communities or FTCs found present on the land. Um, when and if the process is supported by the WAPC and the Minister uh, and progresses through and a development application is lodged, we will then give consideration to those environmental matters. Um, I would note, as we've sort of noted with the staff previously, that obviously one of the key considerations for a caravan park is the amenity for the residents. So the retention of vegetation on the site, which is also actually regrowth, I might note, because um, it's been previously used for pastoral purposes. Um, we would give high priority to the retention of a lot of the trees that are on the site in order to provide amenity for the future residents. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, um, up to a point. Um, uh, I'd be happy to elaborate if there's a specific matter that oh, I suppose you'd I just like us to drill into. Question, um, just then, with the threatened ecological community, that is, a, I mean, you're aware that that is actually a federal matter and that you do have to, um, you know, if you do um, find that you've got a threatened ecological community or, in fact, if somebody else notifies the Commonwealth Government that they believe there is one there, yeah, that's something you'd have to take that on board. Yes, look, yeah, we um, the the application was supported by um, an environmental report by um, Martin Bohm, who's a very eminent um, environmental scientist, well respected in the community. Um, his report didn't find evidence of that, but we are aware of our responsibilities. So you know, any kind of clearing or other things would obviously need to go through the appropriate channels. Uh, and also note that the matter was referred to the EPA. Um, as part and parcel of the usual amendment process. Um, they noted the, um, the larger trees on the site and made recommendations that are covered off in the report. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that. I um, just wanted to just make clear that you did understand that yes. the Thank you. EPA is part of the Western Australian Government yes. um, environmental structure and the Commonwealth Government has another structure in regards to threatening climate. Ecological yeah. communities. Thank you, yes. All right, thanks. Any further questions of Mr Pierce? Thank you, Mr Pierce. Thank you. Uh, Councillors? To staff, Mayor? Uh, yeah, take a question. J just in respect of the process we go through now, this is a uh, local planning scheme amendment. Um, what's the process following that? Do we have a DA that is submitted beyond that? On, on the assumption that the Minister says um, a caravan park can be added to the scheme, then it will still have to go through the whole DA process. Same as the previous item we spoke about. 
Thank you, Mr. Pearce. Thank you. And now, councillors, that brings us now to item 3.3, the proposed Henley Brook structure plan for various lots in Henley Brook of Swan SP slash 2019 slash 4. And there are seven speakers. Before we commence, I just want to clarify the speakers of the process here that will, this will, the item here is to amend the initial application and send it back out for public comment, advertise it, so that it will not come back with those amendments and recommendations and viewpoints for probably another three or four months. So you may wish to speak tonight or save all your bullets for when that comes back as an amended document in three months. Your choice will be yours. Um, the first speaker we have listed is Mr Keith Harrison. On behalf of Mr Keith and Mrs Marjorie Harrison, speaking against the structure plan. Mr Harrison, do you wish to speak? Yep, thank you. You, you two have five minutes. Mr Mayor, councillors, my name's Mark Harrison. I speak on behalf of my parents, Keith and Marjorie Harrison. They live in Park Street, Henley Brook. Um, we are actually in favour of this structure plan, not against the structure plan. Uh, I have read the, uh, I have reviewed the information and plans on the City of Swan website and from that I've obtained the following. The proposed structure plan predominantly identifies public open space on land owned by individual landowners as opposed to the land controlled by the proponent. The identification of public open space on this land, as well as the presence of the gas pipeline, renders our land almost undevelopable, undevelopable. And the proposed structure plan does not outline any staging or what priority will be given to purchasing public open space through the subsequent developer contribution scheme. There are countless instances both within the City of Swan and other governments where these issues have had an adverse impact on landowners, cause, causing significant hardship, in particular for older people looking to relocate, as I'm sure you all are aware. The location of the public open space and other amenities on land owned by individual landowners places an inequitable burden on these landowners compared to the proponent. Coupled with the delays associated with the preparation, adoption and implementation of a developer contribution scheme, this situation can lead to landowners being left with a valueless land. As mentioned, this can leave older landowners in hardship as they may require more appropriate accommodation but have to wait for the developer contribution scheme to buy them out. It is understood that the majority of the public open <coughs> space is located on and adjacent to the gas pipeline as this easement as the easement for the public uh, for the pipeline cannot accommodate residential development. While I agree this is logical, I'm told that the City of Swan will not take management of the public open space over the pipeline and this area will not be credited with the developer contribution scheme and instead the required to be ceded free of cost to the Crown as an unmanaged reserve. This places further imposition on landowners with already constrained sites. The structure plan should take an equitable approach to the location of public open space to ensure that single landowners do not shoulder the majority of the burden of their land which is in this situation, that is likely to cause severe hardship. Further, I request the City to ensure that, that the developer contribution scheme for this area seeks to front load the purchase of public open space from affected landowners and to treat the public open space within the pipeline easement as in the same manner as other public open space to ensure landowners are not worse off. It is imperative that the city purchases public open space up front and then is compensated through the developer contribution scheme. This will ensure that older landowners within the area are not in the situation in which they need to downsize but cannot dispose of their property due to the public open space designation. We are seeking early land acquisition for a course of hardship. Marjorie and Keith are 80 years old this year. 
They've had ill health in recent years through worry and anxiety. They do not have the financial capacity to purchase another property without funds from their home. They've had two firm offers to buy their home only to have the developers shy away due to the planning. Their age is as such they cannot wait for 10 years or more to receive some form of compensation. We seek an earlier solution and assurances as this would assist them to go forward in the remainder of their lives. I believe that Marjorie and Keith Harrison clearly seconds, fall Harrison. within the hardship guidelines. The hardship may also fit the criteria under the Land Administration Act of 1997, section 241, through the loss of land by acquisition due to the proposed public open space. Entitlement to compensation could also be under the Planning and Development Act 2005, section 173, injurious affection and 177. We thank you for the opportunity to speak at this forum to give a better understanding of our plight within this proposed structure plan and hope you can be relied upon to assist us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Harrison. Councillors, any questions to Mr Harrison? Councillor Henderson. Uh, thanks, Mr Harrison. Just want to uh, confirm um, Keith's uh, and Marjorie's lot. Um, does one of the gas pipelines actually go across their land? I that's think? correct. Right. Yes. And so uh, that would mean that if that can't be developed, it would ultimately be the city, I guess, for public open space. Correct. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. So I'll have a question for staff uh, following that. Okay. Thank you. Further questions, Councillor, Mr Harrison? Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Thank you very much. You're going to ask a question. Thank you. Um, so, uh, probably for the CEO, uh, the uh, I think you're aware of the, the lot number 248, um, Mr. CEO. So, uh, what would the process be in terms of that land being acquired, and would it be well after the development, or what stage? Because clearly, uh, if the land isn't going to be taken up by us until maybe a DCP's paid for it or whatever, there may be some considerable years before it's dealt start with. Phil. Start with Phil. I think Mr Russell might start that one off. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, I think the, the speaker has hit on one of the fundamental <coughs> problems of a um, diverse uh, area with multiple landowners and trying to make appropriate spatial provision of public open space. Um, there's a couple of things I'll say, and I think the, the first point made is erroneous. Um, it is unique that city staff have worked very closely with the proponents and the pipeline people to get to a point, as is uh, articulated in the report, that subject to certain tweaks, we can recommend to the council a departure from a decade-long insistent position that we can take pipeline land, easement land, uh, the, uh, the corridor of the pipeline and develop up, up into usable public open space that can be taken on and managed, unlike in the past, managed with minimal problematic, costly and timely disruption in terms of maintenance. So it's a very unique position that the city staff are finding themselves in in making this recommendation to council on the gas pipeline through this area. If I might just explain, Mr Mayor, the problem in the past has been that with the gas pipelines which go through the City of Swan, go through Dayton, go through Brabham, Allen Book, in that even if we wanted to change a sprinkler that deep into the ground, we had to get their approval. So every time we wanted to, there was a problem with the reticulation in the park, for that reason we have refused to take responsibility of this pipeline easement. Until recently, when they have changed um, their attitude on another subdivision um, in the south, um, where um, the pipeline authority is now willing to accept that, A, even though the pipeline's down a metre, two metres below the ground, us replacing a sprinkler at 150, 200 millimetres depth, we don't have to go for their approval and they have to come out and supervise, and we have to pay for that supervision. So it's the problem is every time you wanted to do something with your cricket pitch or change the goalposts at a pavilion or change a sprinkler, additional cost to the council. Therefore, we have in the past, Mr Mayor, as have all the other councils in Perth, refused to take responsibility. There's been a change by the pipeline authority. For that reason, we're now prepared to take it on. But we're still negotiating on that point, and that's for Mr Harrison's benefit. 
Thank you, Mr. Sir. Mr. Russell, you've got some more to add to that? Thank you. Uh, that, that's, that's, it, it is worth stating that, that it's a clear departure from the past. So what that means to answer the Councillor Henderson's question <coughs> is that if the land is capable of being taken on invested and credited as public open space, what this structure plan proposing, and there is, it's no mystery because there is no other way of doing it, that as has been pointed out, certain landowners have portions or more than would be an equitable 10 per cent portion of the land being designated as public open space under this structure plan. So because you don't want to have every single 160-odd lots with 10 per cent little pieces of POS on their individual things because, of course, it would be a pointless checkerboard of public open space, the plan here that designates it principally through the, the, the corridor but in other locations, we do have to have a DCP. Even if it was just for public open space, for this to work, you do need to have a development contribution plan. Now, in, in, uh, forgive me for, for the roundabout way of approach this, but to answer Councillor Henderson's question, Mr Mayor, as I know has been said many times by senior staff in the CA in this chamber, that one of these obligations that the Council inherits when it resolves to take on a DCP is for situations like this gentleman here that need to have uh, whether or not we can, we can take money out of funds or borrow, as has been suggested in the past, against a DCP to buy these people out to get early acquisition for the community and to resolve some of the issues the, the, this gentleman has pointed out. I'll say one last thing, Mr Mayor. You'll hear shortly from representatives of Progress Development, the other developer in here is Mervac. I might suggest that this gentleman makes approaches to them as to whether or not those developers might be keen to purchase the land from this gentleman's family at a fair and equitable market rate and take that as credit against any further DCP. That might be a bit cheeky of you, Mr Mayor, but I'll put that uh, as, a, as a potential solution on the table. Thank you, Mr Rowe. <laughs> and I suppose ultimately, Phil, we, we're still not sure of the attitude of the Minister and the way she's talking about DCPs, whether the funds would be even available in DCP. Councillor Catalano, you got a question? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, is it likely that the pipeline reserve is going to be uh, purchased by the City of Swan for public open space, or is it likely that it's going to be ceded by those private landowners as part of their DC, as part of the DCP? Um, Mr. We'll, CEO, we'll, we'll have to purchase it, Mr. Lane, Mr. Mayor, and then the land. Or, or it's purchased by the developer and then the land is ceded free of cost. One way or the other, it's all part of the DCP um, development contribute. Um, the way it's sorted out, Mr Mayor, it's either ceded or, depending if the developer owns it, or it maybe we've got a purchase. In this case, it would appear that from uh, the description Mr Harrison's given that we will have to purchase it. OK, so it would be purchased rather than these small landowners having to cede it. Yeah, and look, and look this, this has happened in the past with Dayton, where you had multiple landowners and the only way it can work is having a DCP. The problem is, of course, is um, one, first we have to develop that DCP. Um, we have to go approve. This process at the moment may be two, three years away from even before there's any work on site. And then, of course, um, Council's responsibility is, and, and as we found with Dayton, by the way, um, was that council had to go in and buy the land early because certain people wanted to move on, as Mr Harrison has described. The problem is then, um, if all of a sudden there's a big boom, the price of that land could increase quite substantially or the land could decrease. Um, and that's where the DCP contributions, um, if they increase quite substantially, put council under a lot of pressure because we, you are then at high risk but we have in the past taken the attitude to go and borrow money, buy the land, um, basically to hold the price and then build that into the DCP contributions, the repayment of the loans. Um, sorry, just one second, Councillor Keller. Mr Tan, you want to add to that? Three, Mr Mayor. <coughs> the, uh, in terms of DCP, is problematic because <coughs> the major developers do not have contractual arrangement with all the land in the structure planning area. I believe well, they only have uh, from previous uh, briefing one of the developers said they got contractual arrangement for 10 percent and I believe the other ones got <coughs> probably similar amount probably about all up about 25 percent. 
you are asking the city, right, if this goes ahead, to prepare a DCP plan based on 25% contractual arrangement, 75% of landowners, <coughs> excuse me, do not know what the cost of the DCP is going to be. It's, it's problematic. It's a long process to, 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 to deal with this. This is a stage one of the structure plan. And, and you look at the recommendation, there are some deficiencies in some of the re reporting. That's why the recommendation is for them to go back, look at it, come back, re-advertise, come back to the council for a decision. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Councillor Kelly, you got another question? Um, yes, actually. Uh, I'd like to know um, a little bit more. I mean, uh, so thank you, um, Mr. Tan. So first of all, are you saying that really, um, really the best thing is for um, the structure plan to go back for re-advertising? That's um, exactly what the motion is, Councillor. Okay, great. So um, now that you've highlighted that there's uh, problems with the DCP meeting um, the various costs of the public open space, and then also that there might have to be money that needs to be borrowed to buy the land. Now, this structure plan um, clearly um, sort of delineates <coughs> how the lots are going to be broken up and how the public open space is going to be sort of set out. So. Um, can't we have a little bit more information about how much this is going to cost the city, uh, how much the DCP um, can be realised? I mean, I understand, I've just heard, that you've only got contractual arrangements with 25% so of, the, of the landowners, so you've got the 75% that you don't have the um, DCP um, contractual arrangements with, so that must be all these smallholders. So, you know, can we have some kind of figures that basically gives us some kind of scenario about what it's going to cost if you've got only 25% contributing with the, the um, um, contractual uh, management arrangements and what it could cost us if the public open space has to be purchased from the other 75%. Um, because the thing I really am afraid of here is that this is going to be approved and a couple of years down the track, there's going to be, oh, we can't afford to... We've said now that, oh, that'll be all right, don't worry. Um, um, people are going to be... Um, the property's going to be purchased and then down the track it's going is to be, well, we question? can't purchase it. No. Uh, yeah, so my question is, can we please have some figures, real figures, that we can actually make a decision by as to the different kinds of scenarios that it's going to cost ratepayers and, and how... These people are going to actually have their public open, the public open space uh, paid for. Well, Mr. Tan will probably answer, but I would suggest to get the figures you're asking at, you won't be making a decision on us for six months. There's a lot of work to work up at DCP, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Tan, when you've got so many multiple landowners, extremely difficult task. You're correct, Mr. Mayor. Well, I think that, in all fairness, um, to the council and to also all these people here who are affected, who are you know 75% of the people in, in this particular structure plan, I think that six months is worth, um, especially if it's going to go if if it does go out to advertising. I think it's only fair that actually we do have that information so that you know we can make decisions um, based on on a kind of rational um, approach to this uh, structure plan so that we don't end up with um, people being very unhappy down the future. So. Right, then I'll we'll give you some work to do this week. Any other questions, councillors? OK, we'll go to the next speaker, which is Miss Nicole Gill, speaking against the structure plan. Miss Gill, you too have five minutes. Thank you. I would like to oppose the proposed Henley Brook local structure plan based on the fact that it does not adhere to the City of Swan's Urban Growth Corridor Development Plan. The Urban Growth Corridor Development Plan clearly states, commercial development proposed within the urban corridor is focused on activity centres. Going on to say, 
These activity centres will not only include increased residential densities and commercial facilities, but regularly schools and community buildings and facilities. Facilities such as community use rooms and sporting pavilions, which will be placed alongside public open space playing fields, provide opportunities for community groups and clubs to occupy a space for their chosen activity. This development currently has approximately 2.5 primary schools going in and still no community centre, no commercial area, nothing. There's no limit on the number of residences that are going in here. The structure plan is very vague. It's approximated at 3,500 homes. However, that approximation was based on an average block size of 400 square metres. Recent council papers now suggest a maximum block size of 300 square metres and a minimum size of 160 square metres, which would greatly increase the number of residences. It is difficult to plan for a community when you are unsure the size of the community. Furthermore, there is no detail on the plan of block sizes. The whole plan just says R30 to R60 with no real planning as to what will be in what area. The urban corridor development plan states that community centres and commercial centres need to be placed in the centre of the development. This enhances the community feel of the development. This development does not have anything. The developers have told us that there is a possibility of a town centre being placed in the most furthest northwest boundary actually outside the development area. This town centre hinges on the fact that the train line is going to have a train stop there. The Metronet line currently has no stop listed for that area. So I'm very unsure about how a development can pass with no facilities for a minimum of 10,000 people, but possibly up to 15,000 people, and no real structure of density areas. The City of Swan Urban Corridor Development Plan also states that sensitivities need to be shown to those properties outside of the development area. This structure plan currently shows no sensitivity to people outside of the development area. We literally have five acre properties with 160 square metre properties across the road. This is not showing any sensitivity to those lands who are currently in the Swan Valley Protection Precinct. There is no sensitivity shown to the people on large properties on Park Street, nor the people on the boundary of Morgan Fields. The people on the boundary of Morgan Fields bought nearly 20 years ago with the insurance from the City of Swan that the five acre properties surrounding us were part of the St Leonard's wetlands area and could not be less than two hectares. That was the assurance we built on. Now we have a primary school on our back fence and 160 square metre lots surrounding us. This is not showing sensitiv sensitivity to the surrounding areas. I also have concerns about the wetlands development. The question here is currently all the properties in this development area, the houses sit on a sand pad about one metre high. There is nothing on this yeah, development plan that states what the ground level is going to be. If the ground level is increased to one metre higher than it is now, effectively anyone behind the Morgan Fields boundary will be looking straight into our properties. Nothing has been suggested to ensure our privacy. There has been no talk of what's going to happen to existing residents. I feel a lot more work needs to be done on this structure plan. There needs to be a lot more collaboration with neighbours to get a structure plan that is right and good for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Gill. Questions, councillors of Ms Gill? No, thank you, Ms Gill. Next speaker on this is Mr... I'll get this right, I think, Mr Humphrey Bogart. That's correct. 
There's a line there. It might go something like, of all the council chambers in all of the world, you had to pick this one, but I've best you've yeah. heard that before. <laughs> well, thank, you, thank you, Mr Bogart. You yeah, have five right. minutes. I'm used to it. <laughs> Reading through the document preparing for this ordinary meeting of the Council, it appears to me that no comments made by the general public are incorporated by two objections by landowners. Uh, how many submissions were there in total? And did none of the submissions have anything worthwhile to be incorporated? Now I would like to talk about transport. From my appraisal, the traffic modelling for the Henley Brook development area is clearly not up to date. The effect of the Allenbrook train line uh, has not been and cannot be uh, assessed since expected patronage data will not be released by Metronet till mid-2020. There's no traffic modelling available for the new Drumpelier Drive. The current upgrade works at Reed Highway uh, make it impossible to have a proper uh, comprehensive traffic surveys. So for that reason, the whole traffic plan out of this uh, proposal should be weighted till the new data is available. The eastern one and a half kilometres of Park Street and Henley Brook is inside the Swan Valley Planning Act area. That means that shouldn't be a thoroughfare for commuter traffic. Also, upgrading Park Street would mean an extra amount of traffic on West One Road. West One Road is supposed to be a thoroughfare for tourists, not for commuters, so that should be minimised. Widening roads and building more roads are not sustainable solution for increased people movements and it is an outdated business model for a transport uh, problem. Now coming back to the uh, environment. In 2008, the Gano Climate Change Review, which examined scientific evidence around the impact of climate change on Australia and its economy, predicted that without adequate measures, the nation would face more and in more intense bushfires by 2020. Unfortunately, the prediction was right. So catastrophic bushfires over East highlight that business as usual cannot be further continued. The impact of any suburban development is felt or will be felt for many, many years to come. Combining those two issues, it is clear that our approach to urban development has to change now. The change should not only come through regulations, international financial institutions, investment bankers, insurance companies, they all more and more often state that the fiduciary duties of company directors should take into account strong action on climate change. A former chairman of the global giant, insurance giant, EXA, says a two degree might be insurable, a four degree world is not insurable. Natural catastrophes will have enormous costly effects. The financial industry also talks about potential suing of companies that do not follow those rules. And governments at all levels are also targeted if they knowingly ignore the impacts of climate change. And this is not even looking at the ethical and moral issues carrying out climate change, uh, the avoidance, the mitigation or the adaption in the benefit of the current and future generations. My question, where is the evidence that the city has stepped up its action on climate change and insisted in this development to comply with the one and a half degree centigrade target set by the IPCC? So in conclusion, the current Henley Brook structure plan cannot be adopted unless the concerns like in this deputation and in my submission are adopted. Environmental concerns, avoidance, mitigation and adaption should be seconds, central, yeah, central to assessing this and any future small or large development. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. By the way, it would be appreciated if future documents have all page number at the bottom. It makes it easier. <laughs> Thank you, oh, Mr. Sorry.
Bogart, um, questions before you go? Councillor Coley. Yeah. Uh, through you, Mayor, just interested in uh, receiving a copy of that deputation, if you could send it out to all councillors. Yes, I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? Thank you, Mr Bogart. Pleasure. Uh, next speaker on this is Miss Catherine Muraresco, speaking against the structure plan in relation to the provision of schools. Okay, thank you, Mayor and councillors, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I refer to the recommendation made to you regarding the Henley Brook local structure plan, which impacts various lots in Henley Brook. My husband and I, together with our two teenage children, reside at 11 Asturian Drive, Henley Brook. This is the location that is recommended for the Eastern Public Primary School. Whilst it's not the location of the primary school that concerns us, it is the acquisition process that the Department of Education has historically used to compensate residents such as us in cases such as ours, and based on this process, we object to the recommendation. If Council endorse and accept the structure plan with the current officer recommendation, then the WA Planning Commission also provide their approval. We cannot do anything with our land. No one will buy it and our greatest asset will become valueless through no fault of our own. This is because, historically, the Department of Education does not provide compensation until such time as they receive funding and are ready to build the said primary school. The proposed structure plan does not outline any staging or what priority will be given to purchasing school sites. It has already been evidenced through previous similar cases in the Swan Valley region where property has been acquired for school sites that, that this could take up to 10 to 15 years. Meanwhile, we will be surrounded by urban encroachment with an increase in traffic, noise, rubbish and massive safety issues while surrounding building is underway, robbing us of any satisfactory options. Clearly, it is simply not a fair process or outcome. My husband first bought in rural Henley Brook 33 years ago. We have been aware of the future possibility of subdivision and do not object to the idea in theory. In fact, as we age, we would welcome the opportunity to sell, downsize and provide support and opportunity to our children to enter the property market. This has always been our vision. However, if history repeats and the acquisition process does not provide for early compensation, we will be potentially 70 years of age before we can do anything of this nature. If we were to support the proposal, we would require the recommended amendments to include the following. That the developer contribution scheme front loads the purchase of this school site, or that the council purchase a school site and then seek compensation from the developer contribution scheme. Either of these would enable us to receive compensation sooner rather than later and simply give us the freedom to get on with our lives without the undue stress and anxiety that this proposal is causing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Gill. I would just make a note that the decision on schools is a decision to be made by the Department of Education and the WA Planning Commission. It's up to them to purchase that land and plan for that land. As That's fine. To one. But okay. this proposal recommends that our property be a school. That's right. I and, object um, to that good, because then, of those um, when reasons. It goes back out to, well, if it goes back out to advertise, you'll be able to add a further comment. Questions, councillors? None. Thank you, Ms Gill. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Ms Resco. But myself there. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Next speaker is Ms Karina Johnson from Johnson Property Group. On behalf of a number of landowners speaking in support of the structure plan but against some of the parts of the recommendation. Ms Johnson, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking. I'm Karina Johnson from Johnson Property Corporation and I've been working over the last few years with a number of the landowners in an effort to try and put some parcels together and unite landowners so that the fragmentation um, doesn't diminish on their development opportunities. But tonight I'm representing two landowners, the Muir family who are at 254 Park Street and the Cervantes family who are at 658 Lord Street. Both of these landowners are in support of urbanisation of the Brooklands Precinct and the, and the applicant's local structure plan as it has been lodged. 
these landowners have been quasi-urban landowners now for many years since the development of Morganfields to the north and Brabham to the south and the resultant loss of rural amenity that they had enjoyed for many years. So they're keen to see this resolved and, as I say, they're in support. This is not to mention the long-term roadworks, the Lord Street deviation, the general infrastructure works that are ongoing. And so we are pleased that it is nearing a resolution. With regards to the Muir family, who own 254 Park Street, they have concerns over some of the officer's recommendations, noting that the Muirs are both retired and their entire financial future depends on the outcome of the LSP and that's the, the sale of their land. This matter has taken nearly five years so far and they will remain in limbo until this LSP and DCP is determined. Their concerns relate to a, some quite specific things, these being the further widening of Park Street at the moment, we propose 4.4 metres. You're moving that to six metres. The lack of access, which will be permitted off Park Street, despite the fact that the landowners on the other side in the Brabham subdivision that front Park Street all having access, um, and how that will impact on this land being developed. And the resultant also setbacks that will happen with the development land, as it's opposite um, a street called Arpent Link, which means that there'll be further traffic setbacks. To put this in context, the Muirs are already losing 85% of their land to public open space. They only have 15%, which is about 3,000 square metres. So when we take into account the recommendations of the officers, this really makes this remaining 3,000 square metres much less and likely, from a practical perspective, to not be developable at all. With regards to 658 Lord Street, which is now Starflower Place, this family's concerns are over the recently installed gas pipeline by ATCO. This was to provide services to subdivisions to the south and there was no land, landowner consultation at that time. It was um, installed into the road reserve and that was about three years ago, so not very long ago. The buffers that are now being applied to all the land that front the ATCO gas pipeline, which is all the way down Starflower Place, have cause, will cause a diminution of value and the lack of um, maximising, or will be unable to maximise the property's value accordingly. What we're concerned about is how this happened, how the landowners were not ad advised and how now we're dealing with this affecting the LSP. Finally, we do not agree that the full cost of the construction of Henleybrook Drive, where it abuts this structure plan, should be paid by these landowners within this precinct as part of the DCP. We believe that there are many other commuters going to be using that road, both from the east, the north and the south, and it's fair that it should be a more equitable solution than full cost. So we ask that that be shared. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Ms Johnson. Any questions, councillors? No, thank you. The next speaker is Mr Aaron Lohman from Element WA and Ms Kelly Lavelle of 360 <coughs> Environmental, speaking on behalf of Mr Graham Wilson, owner, speaking support of the structure plan. Mr Lohman, you look like you're on your own. I am. Um, thank you, councillors, for the opportunity. You have five minutes. To speak, um, Ms. Labelle is, is um, unable to, <coughs> excuse me, at, to attend last night. Um, just for the sake of clarity, we support the overall concept of the structure plan. There's elements of that which we um, do not, which are covered in our in our previous submissions, and I'll discuss tonight. Um, as uh, as is indicated, I'm here speaking tonight on behalf of Mr. Graham Wilson, the owner of Lot 100, 100 Brooklands Drive in Henley Brook. Um, as set out in, in our submissions on the matter and as identified in the agenda report, there are some deficiencies in the local water management strategy which informs configuration of the LSP um, and that is particularly so in respect to our client's site. Um, the key critical issues uh, for our client in respect to the LWMS, uh, as we have been advised by our, our hydrologist, is that the local water management strategy does not provide sufficient detail on the proposed treatment of St Leonard's Creek and the LSP. 
the extent of the floodplain and location of drainage areas needs to be modelled and the results need to be used to refine the size and location of the proposed drainage areas and, a and associated public open space. Uh, the floodplain mapping appears to be derived from a, a floodplain study completed in 1997. However, there appears to be more available and recent floodplain data on DWERS online mapping. Uh, a drainage area is proposed on a client site within a floodplain area. Um, as set out within our submissions, the, LS, the LWMS has informed the location of POS within the LSP area. The problem is, given the deficiencies identified in the local water management strategy, uh, the POS areas cannot be appropriately cited or the spatial extent confirmed. And this is the main concern from our, for our client, as, the, as his entire land holding has been identified for POS. Um, the reason for the POS is the site contains significant areas of drainage. Um, in respect to the drainage area, we've been advised by a hydrologist that it cannot be located within the site as, is, as it was within a floodplain, flood, sorry, flood prone area. Uh, Stormwater during major rainfall events cannot be detained in a flood prone area. The officers recommend the submission of a revised local water management strategy to address concerns raised. Um, that's concerns raised by both the city, um, DWER and ourselves. Um, this recommendation is supported. In our submission, and as some of the previous uh, submitters tonight have, have commented on, we raise concern about the equitable distribution of public open space. Uh, by way of background, our client's land holding is, is not an investment property. It contains the family home. It was purchased in 1994. Um, the officer's report notes that the equitable distribution of POS will be resolved by a developer contribution scheme. Uh, the draft state planning policy 3.6 infrastructure contributions states that a DCP should be prepared concurrently or within six months following the approval of a structure plan. Um, the approval or the commencement of a developer contributions scheme would seem to offer some further certainty for landowners. Uh, in respect to POS distribution, our client is significantly concerned in respect to the future of the property and likely development scenarios. Our client's view is that the subject site is suitable for residential development. Uh, whilst it's recognised that St Leonard's Brook traverses the property uh, and is a modified drain rather than a brook through our client's site, in most circumstances it would be included within a POS corridor. However, such a corridor should not occupy the total extent of the site. In that regard, we also note that there are four drainage watercourses uh, within easements running through north-south connections between Henley Street and St Leonard's Creek, although these are not identified and been being retained in POS corridors as a similar manner as the one within our client's site. To conclude, our client requests that the that the Council support the officer's recommendation in respect to modifications to the local water management strategy. In addition, it is requested that Council have consideration in respect to an additional, inf additional recommendation to be added into the, uh, the officer's recommendation to review uh, the allocation of POS associated with drainage areas to, make, to allow for a more yeah, equitable seconds, distribution. Uh, there is opportunities to do this through the revisions to the LWMS to, to facilitate development opportunities for our client in line with their view that the site should be developed for residential purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lohman. Any questions, councillors? Councillor Kiley, you're first. Just to staff, in respect of those uh, proposed changes to the, the well, drainage... Let's get the questions from Mr Lohman first. Councillor oh, Johnson, sorry. did you indicate? No? Councillor Kellar? Sorry, what lot was that again? A lot 100. Lot <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any further questions of Mr. Lehman, councillors? No. Thank you, Councillor Collier. You. Question staff. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just interested in in respect of the changes to the drainage that is proposed in the in the uh, report. What at what stage will that take place? The, uh, the that has been spoken about is that um, when it's re-advertised. Uh, how does that? How does that be, become integrated into the, into the overall structure okay. plan? Mr Russell, do you understand that question? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes. Well, Council, as you can see before you, starting on page 180, and it's very rare I've seen a recommendation on a structure plan that has as many alterations and modifications as this one, but I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised. You would expect nothing less given the complexity of uh, 
the multiplicity of landowners in this. And I might add, uh, Mr Mayor, in my time here, this is the most complicated multi-landowner uh, structure plan that the city has received ever. So uh, all of the changes, you can see there's a great raft of changes that the applicant needs to do. This has been communicated to the applicant. They won't be standing in front of you saying this is a mystery to them because it has been communicated to them throughout this entire process. Uh, I understand to their credit they are in the process even before this was finalised as a recommendation of doing some of that work and we will hear more from that. Uh, it is all going to be there and be done uh, um, uh, as part of the re-advertising process. Okay. Uh, Mayor, in, just res in respect of the speakers who have spoken tonight in, uh, against this who, who would like some further change potentially, um, how can they, uh, are they able to contact council and or staff and see whether their um, changes are included in, this, in the recommendation or? Um, Is that a landowner? I suggest they could do that, yep. Okay. Would that be an appropriate they, course they of action? Well, well, except Mr Mayor, process. we're not preparing the structure plan, we're assessing the structure we're plan, Mr Mayor. assessing the structure Mayor. plan, that's exactly right. There's a difference. So the structure plan is being prepared by two no, developers yeah, and the next one is Mr Mark Zabo, who's going to, he's one of the people who's, his company's been in part of that preparation, Councillor. Can I ask him that question, Councillor? So just in respect of if we wanted to alter the recommendation as an alternative uh, motion, um, what's the appropriate course of action in that respect or how do we find out? Uh, I'm just well, I reckon between now and next Friday you should have to think about what you want to do and talk to the staff about it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker on this item is indeed Mr Mark Zabo from the Birch's Design Group speaking uh, in support of the structure plan. Mr Zabo. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillors, uh, as stated, I'm Mark Sabo from Burgess Design Group, uh, representing Little Property Group and uh, Progress Developments, who are the proponents of this structure plan. Uh, we've uh, got to say we've appreciated the work of Council's officers up to this stage in assessing and preparing the report before you today, and uh, particularly the positive recommendation of support subject to modifications. Um, we note all the issues that have been raised in, in the report by officers and uh, the relevant referral agencies and we generally support the uh, recommended modifications. I can advise Council that we are continuing to work a, a, as we speak on a number of those issues. Mr Zabo, can I just ask you to hold up for a few seconds? I just want to clarify something with the two Councillors left the room. They have only declared an impartiality and they don't have to leave the room, so we're just going to make sure that they know that and then come back. So if you just wouldn't mind hanging on for a few seconds. Uh, Mr. Mayor, while you're waiting, uh, could I ask a question? Just clarifying, that's what they're doing. <coughs> could I ask a question while you're waiting? Yeah, why not? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, a point was raised earlier about the contribution towards um, Henleybrook Avenue more broadly uh, rather than associated uh, land. Um, how would that be, or how could that be dealt with? <coughs> Deal with that after. There's a number of ways you can deal with it, Councillor, but normally if uh, an Atua road is going next to a development, um, they have to provide one carriageway and dual carriageway earthworks if that's what's needed. Otherwise, uh, if there's a change to that proposal, um, it's the need and nexus and being able to provide exactly the amount of traffic that might be coming out of that area as opposed to the amount of traffic coming out of other areas. But normally for all of that road further down, and Mr Tan and Mr Russell can correct me if I'm wrong, it's if it's going past your property, you've got to provide at least one carriageway. So Mr Zabi, you can continue. Councillor McNamara, uh, McNamara has got a small medical condition and Councillor Congdon's having a comfort break, so carry on. So yes, yeah, so I was getting to the point where we're, um, we're continuing to work on, on a number of the issues that have been raised in the report with you, and uh, uh, that includes some of the requests for further information. Uh, of those, our traffic engineers, they're actually updating the modelling to meet the main roads requirements. Um, our enviro and water experts are working on a revised local water management strategy and the foreshore study for St Leonard's Creek. Both of them are being uh, undertaken directly in consultation with DWER and the DBCA. They're also reviewing the bushfire issues that have been raised by DFES, so that's all going on. 
Um, we're also looking at uh, some of the design options uh, to increase the size of the school sites, as mentioned in your report, and uh, the adjoining public open space areas, which is also mentioned. And also we're looking at designs to accommodate the potential for an additional school, if we're so directed to do that uh, by the Commission uh, later in the process. Um, and it's in relation to these required design modifications that, that our only real issue with the um, officer recommendation arises. Uh, that issue is being the required re-advertising of the structure plan now at this stage, prior to its assessment by the uh, West Australian Planning Commission. Whilst we've prepared the structure plan generally in accordance with the policies and requirements of the Commission, there are some elements where the policies provide guidance and some latitude for us. To, uh, to look at different ways uh, of addressing those things and subject to appropriate justification, they can be supported by the Commission. Some may be supported, some may not. Our concern is that uh, we may be required to make further modifications by the Commission that would require a further round of advertising once they have made their assessment. Uh, a specific example where this may happen does relate to the school sites. Uh, while we argue that the provision of a third school site within our structure plan area is not justified and uh, we uh, are happy to accept the officer's support on this point and their recommendation to increase the school sizes. Um, we have no idea as to whether that will actually be supported by the Commission, as logical it might be. So if we um, modify now and re-advertise, then if the Commission does not agree with this, we'll then be forced to redesign and re-advertise again. Um, and we, we have some concerns about some of those uh, issues of re-advertising um, and the amount of work that it takes to actually do that. When the documents are revised, it's not just a matter of changing the physical plan. Uh, significant additional work has to be done requiring things like, as I've mentioned, the rerunning of the, the traffic modelling, redesigning the drainage uh, strategy, reviewing and moving public open spaces and the drainage areas, amongst other things. So, look, I'm happy to acknowledge that part of our motivation is to avoid that additional round of advertising and it's to avoid the extra time required, but it's also to avoid significant additional costs. And there's also the issue about uh, the uncertainty for some of the landowners that are in there now and the addi additional time it's going to take. And some of the, and our experience is that you can end up getting a bit of confusion with the broader community when you're advertising multiple plans. So we certainly appreciate the positive recommendation that you have before you and we're accepting of, of the, um, the modifications suggested generally. Um, however, we would ask Council to consider the option of forwarding its recommendations on this structure plan to the Commission without the requirement for advertising now, but subject to Council wishing for it to be re-advertised once the Commission has assessed it, so that their changes, if they have any, can be included in that advertising. So the community only sees one more version of this plan uh, and, again, has the opportunity to comment. Um, so that, that's our only real issue with it at this stage. Thank you, Mr Zala. Councillors, any questions? Councillor Kiley. I'm interested to see if that's been done before in any, any other examples, um, where they've sent it to the WAPC for comment and then sent it back for re-advertising um, to, to incorporate those changes. And maybe staff might be able to answer yourself. Well, as far as I'm aware, there's certainly nothing to stop Council doing that. It's making their final recommendation to the Commission, which would include all the modifications plus the requirement to re-advertise. It certainly makes sense. I'm just interested if there's any, it's been done before or <coughs> staff could make comment. As far as I'm aware, it can be done that way, Mr Mayor. It's an option for Council to consider. Thank you, Mr C. And would that have to be incorporated in an amendment to the motion? Uh, under the current motion before you, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Thank you, Mr Zabo. That takes us now, councillors, to item 3.4, which is the pro proposed change of use for a place of worship. Oh, no, we'll done, no. Place of worship and construction of a temple with associated living spaces and work at lot 150173 Albert Road, Middle Swan. The first speaker is Ms Kelly Thomas, speaking in favour of the recommendation for refusal. Thank you, Ms Thompson. You have five minutes. Hi. Um, thank you and good evening, councillors. 
I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the officer's recommendation to refuse the proposed place of worship at 173 Albert Road in Middleswan. Now, even though I'm speaking on behalf of the landowners adjacent to the site, as well as at least a dozen of the 64 objecting parties that were consulted during advertising, I'd like to note that it's only paramount that I make a few brief comments due to the sufficient reasoning um, already outlined within the officer's recommendation. The first point I'd like to make is to simply emphasise just how incompatible the proposal is with the local streetscape and rural character of the area. The proposed uh, development is not so much the concern in terms of appearance, but rather the noise and traffic implications it will have on the future amenity of the area. To understand this, you only have to look at where the existing places of worship have been strategically placed. For example, a quick look at Google Maps shows the pattern of um, such uses being located along major arterial roads and adjacent to less sen sensitive land uses, unlike Elbert Road and its neighbouring local distributors. It is also considered worthy of note that the two places of worship used as examples within the applicant's submission were not identified on maps in the report. I believe this would have raised the conclusion that the ongoing noise and parking complaints for the establishment in Nolamara, which was used in, as in the first example, can be more likely attributed to the fact it is situated on a quiet local road and less likely attributed to the culture of the patrons. As opposed to its comparison, of course, that was used at the, as the other example, which is conveniently located along an avenue boasting four lanes of traffic and ad adjacent to an industrial area. Arguably, the land use and development considered as part of this proposal would be much better suited to a location along a larger scale road and adjoining less sensitive land uses. This would all but eliminate the risk rate of residents raising noise and traffic complaints in the future. Please don't get me wrong. A number of the residents objecting to the proposal, including myself, feel empathetic towards the applicant and the families of the association as it must be difficult learning that the discretionary use applying to a place of worship on the subject site does not mean that it is suitable nor compatible with the existing rural, act, rural activities within, this, um, sorry, within which it surrounds. And for this reason, I believe discretion in this, um, for this application should not be exercised by council. Lastly, the final point I'd like to make is that should council support the officer's recommendation to refuse the proposal, and the applicant then wishes to uh, exercise their right of appeal, that it be noted that even if the scale of the development is reduced in an attempt to reach a mediated outcome, um, that the inconsistencies with Area C objectives under the Swan Valley Planning Act prevail. It is therefore respectfully requested that Council endorse the officer's recommendation to refuse the proposal whilst ever more in, um, endorsing the current objectives uh, of Area C and those under the uh, Swan Valley Action Plan which understandably revolve around ensuring that only land uses which encourage, protect and maintain the rural character of the area are supported. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Thompson. Any questions, councillors? No, thank you. Our next speaker is Mr Clinton Sorensen speaking in favour of the recommendation for refusal. Thank you, Mr Sorensen. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Kelly. I think she's already left the room, but uh, I won't repeat as requested what she said. I think it's fairly clear the objection that we have in the immediate area for the, the application that's been submitted. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the amenity of the area. It's a great word, 49 times, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, in uh, the, the Planning Act. Um, but it's appropriate in this case. The, the, the applicant in this instance has actually put forward that they see it as a dead area of the valley uh, in their response, I think, to the feedback that they received from... Um, from the, the feedback that was given to the City of Swan in regards to this application, which I actually reject. Um, clearly, I've been living there for 10 years. Um, there's been quite a good bit of building activity in the Area C in the corner of Middle Swan, as these guys will know, in Albert, Dalgetty, Wilson and Swan Road over the last 10 years, which I think endorses the fact that people are attracted to that area for the rural nature of the area, okay? The ability to pursue rural pursuits. And clearly, this application is not in line with those objectives. So I don't want to repeat 1995 points one to seven. 
um, that have been outlined in, in the recommendation from the City of Swan, and I applaud you for the position that you've come up with. I'd like to probably put forward a different approach on this. I'm concerned that the recommendation is to reject outright um, and go give the option to go to SAT. Um, and I urge all of the councillors, and I know I'm talking, I'm supporting the application, to actually closely explore the two options that have been put forward by the city. Because uh, option B is extremely onerous, laborious upon the applicant, and is probably more of a no than option one. Uh, with the request to upgrade roads and infrastructure and everything else, which is a significant financial burden, and would also land the application at the planning committee rather than at SAT. So I urge all the councillors to, to closely look at this application. It should be one of the last ones that come through that affect area B or C in the Swan Valley. Let's make sure one doesn't get through to close the gate. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Any questions, councillors? Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And that takes us now to uh, item 3.5, which is change of use for place of worship at lot number two, number 36, Arbon Way, Lockridge. And we have one speaker on this, Mr Jason Hunt from Stationwide Planning, uh, speaking in support of the recommendation with amendment to Commission 4. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Mayor and uh, councillors and staff. Um, thank you for the opportunity to make a presentation. Uh, the applicant is seeking a change of use from the current community purpose to a place of worship. The subject site is zoned private clubs and institutions, and under the local planning scheme, a place of worship is a discretionary use in this zone. The building, when it was originally built, was a church and then was repurposed for a community centre and is now seeking approval to again be used as a church. Um, the intention for the site is to allow the uh, Nazareth Pentecostal Church to operate at the site. The Nazareth Pentecostal Church currently shares two different sites for their services, one in Malaga with the North Side Pentecostal Church and the other at a community hall in Kenwick. So as you can imagine, they're fairly keen to secure their own premises so that they can continue to grow their church and their community. Uh, the church members are from... Uh, um, Myanmar, which was previously Burma, there are refugees who have fled their country due to religious persecution. Uh, the church provides spiritual support uh, for the members as they establish their lives in Australia. A significant number of the congregation actually live in the city, with the majority living in Bennett Springs, Bellagura and Lockridge. Um, the church pastor is, uh, is here tonight. Um, to represent the church and, uh, and we are happy at the end to take any questions if any councillors have them. Um, we generally support the recommendation of the officers, which is option one. However, we are here to request an amendment to condition number four on there. Um, to assist uh, at the end of this deputation, I have printed a copy of uh, what we would like the, uh, the condition to read, so I will hand that out or make that available if that can be given to the councillors. Um, currently, Condition 4 limits the use of the premises to three and a half hours a week, which is certainly what will generally occur for the majority of the time. We do, however, point out that we also requested the observance of significant Christian events as part of the application. Um, we did outline, and this was noted in the uh, officer's report dot point three of the key issues on page one, that the site would be used for regular congregations and significant Christian events, as occurs in other churches. These include, but are not limited to, Christmas, Easter, weddings for congregation members, which currently Condition 4 does not allow to occur, which we think is actually just an unintentional admission in the, uh, in the report. We will uh, we'll let you know that the church has not in the last five years conducted any weddings or funerals. But as we're sure you would all appreciate, these can be significant events for members of the church community and we consider it reasonable that they be able to occur at this site. We certainly support the maximum occupancy number applied in the officer's report and do not have any concerns with placing a limitation of 9pm on any events that occur at the site. 
We therefore would request your support to amend Condition 4 to allow the church to serve the community as can occur with other churches in the city of Swan. What we're seeking Condition 4 to read, and I will hand this out, is that the maximum occupancy for the site is 70 people and all services or events are to conclude prior to 9pm. The service times are to be Saturday evening, 6.30pm to 8pm and Sunday from 1pm to 3pm. The site can be used for significant Christian events, including but not limited to Christmas, Easter, wedding and funerals for congregation members as required. Any change to the weekly congregation hours will require lodgement and approval by the city to ensure sufficient parking can be provided. Mr Hunt, you have 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, we consider this a suitable site for the church to, due to the zoning and that they be allowed the freedom to operate as other churches are in the city and the area. Thank you for your time. And as I've said, I'm happy to leave copies of that uh, recommendation. OK, you could pass that around. Um, any questions, councillors? Councillor Kiley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Jason. I, I, I did, uh, you did get that email that I said I'd consider that one. Yes, but, thank you um, very much, Council. I'm just interested in the ownership of the... It's Roman Catholic Archbishop of Perth is the owner. Is there yes. a, is, will it be change ownership... Once yes, approval. yes, the, uh, the the community have, uh, as was in the app, they've put in an offer to purchase subject to um, obtaining a change of use, so yes. And who would be the new owners if this if the condition goes through? Uh, the exact name, I can get the clarity, but it's the Nazareth, uh, Nazareth Church. Yeah, Nazareth Pentecostal Church, yes. Um, in, in respect of... Um, Funerals and weddings, where have they been held in over the past five years? You said none have been held. None have been held, no. There haven't been any. A very fortunate yes. community <laughs> to belong to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you should join up, yes. Um, uh, thank you, and I look forward to um, looking at that uh, further amendment. All right, thank you very much thank for you. your time. Councillors, any further questions of Mr Hunt? No, thank you, Mr Hunt. Next item, councillors, is item 3.8, proposed shed lot. 8811 number 236 Banrock Drive, The Vines. And Mr David Carr, who I don't see in the gallery. No, carry on to item 3.9, proposed shed, lot 64, number 61, <coughs> Memorial Avenue, Baskerville. And Miss Lucy Stokes speaking against the recommendation. Thank Hi. you, Miss Stokes. You've got five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity. Um, I am... One, I am the, the, one of the la adjoining landowners to um, lot 64, number 61, Memorial Avenue, and um, we did originally approve um, the four metre boundary after many discussions and um, lots of toing and froing and lots of emotional drama. Um, however, having looked at what's come through um, on the agenda and the incidents that have occurred since we gave this approval, we won't wish to revoke our approval. Um, the reason being is that... Um, was originally told to be 20 metres. We said oh, we would agree to six metres because the landowner told us if we didn't agree to six metres that he would do it at six metres and take the lean-to off the shed and put the container there anyway. And we thought that we had no um, way of getting around that. However, we found that this may not be the case. Um, we also thought that there may be regulations in the council that would um, regulate the height of the sand pad we have had nearly three metres of fill put in on that side of the boundary and it is now sitting nearly a metre above our ground level and it's right on our back fence. And further to the pad that is there for the shed, there's now more sand being dumped in and it's um, about 15 metres down on, like on our back of our yard and it's also nearly a metre above our ground level. And we've gone from um, vines and olive trees to the, a mini Sahara desert and the environmental impact in this last, that last sort of 40 degree heat, um, our house on the southern side turned into um, unlivable. We couldn't go outside, it was so hot. And we've had to, um, at the moment, we have a piece of masonite up on our window to protect us from the heat from the sand and also the amenity. Um, we're also concerned about the, um, the soil that was used for the sand pad, it appears to be recycled construction and demolition waste. 
um, which um, we've asked um, for some documentation to say that it doesn't have asbestos, DDT, children, lead paint and heavy metals, and we still haven't received anything about that. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> we also now have a 20-foot container on our border, four metres from our fence line. Um, it's partially screened by our brick wall, um, but it is um, invading our privacy and it's sort of brought how close this, this, amend, this building is going to be and what an, um, a, um, the visual impact of it is just, it's just mind-blowing. So I just, we believe, we don't understand why the shed is put near our boundary, why isn't it able to be put on the other side of the, their property and not sitting right outside my kitchen window, my lounge, my backyard. Um, our living in the Swan Valley, now we feel like we're in a residential subdivision by for the amount of sand that's been placed there and we want to know what the extra sand is for when the shed was supposed to finish at the brick wall but we've now got another 30 metres of sand pad. Um, I also notice in the proposal that there's no mention that the shed is going to be used for horse stand-up, wash bay feed and horse storage. In the container we now have hay and we're concerned about um, fire because it's four metres from our wall. We're concerned about the ignition of fire and also um, mice and vermin coming through to our house because of the close proximity of this container with hay in it. Um, the property does get very wet and in the last flood in 27, um, 2017 February um, over half the area was under flood and I noticed in the proposal it says that it's um, shed is for um, vineyard on purposes and there's only like about two little tiny, two or three tiny vines left on the property which you'll be able to see from the picture of, of the property. So it's really for horses and if the property gets wet they'll have to bring the horses up to the shed and that shed is four metres from our house. Um, so I'd like you to consider our objection to this um, to this development of this proposed shed that maybe it could be moved further down. Originally it was a 20 metre barrier because of the height. Um, so either it can be, I don't know that they have 20 metres to do that, but I would prefer it to be placed on the other side of their block and not right near our house. Thank you, Ms Stokes. Okay. Despite your news, you did a good job. Councillors, any questions, Ms Stokes? Yep, Councillor Coley. Mayor to staff. Okay. Any no other questions, councillors? Thank you, Ms Stokes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carley. Uh, I'm interested, Mayor, in why the staff um, did not take the Swan Valley Planning Committee's advice for the 10 metre setback and went with the four. I'm just interested in an elaboration on that one. Mr Russell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, surprisingly this evening you've heard from the neighbour who was consulted and by right admission had said previously her non-objection has now changed to an objection. So when you have a submission uh, by any party that suggests, and in this instance the committee, that for an unspecified reason a shed should be 10 metres from the boundary, ostensibly when we're looking at that in terms of perhaps an issue of any uh, visual impact on a neighbour who when consulted through this process has made no submission, certainly hasn't suggested there's a visual impact situation. Um, I could not in all conscience recommend that this council makes a recommendation to shift something 10 metres ostensibly for the purposes of mitigating visual impact when the adjoining neighbour has said I don't have a problem for it or hasn't, hasn't previously objected. That would last that long in the State Administrative Tribunal, Mr Mayor, that long. That's the reason. Thank you, Mr Russell. Just to follow Further on, question. now that there is an objection, would that still last for zero seconds in SAT or, or would it uh, last a bit longer? If you like, Mr Mayor, I might as well add to that. Um, the SAT would look at something and, and adopt the quite possibly reasonably a horses for courses approach. It would note the adjoining property has structures and sheds at a similar distance. But on this side, there is intervening vegetation. I was in an appeal situation years ago in Middle Swan where a gentleman, and I forget his name, but it might come to me, objected to an extension of a shed. 
and was far more prominent than this along the boundary. In the hearing there, out on site, the presiding member had a look, look, a look around at the area, looked over the fence, looked at the owls and said, the shed's everywhere. This is Shedville. That's the amenity. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Tick. That was some time ago, but these things often, the common sense approach doesn't change. My own view, as I think we'd have to say, what difference does the 10 metre make uh, as opposed to what is being proposed, noting the existing situation next door, noting the vegetation, noting the height of it. Now, amenity is a subjective thing, but again, if you're asking me what my opinion is, I don't think it would, it would last a bit longer than that, but probably not much more, Mr Mayor. Councillor Johnson, you've got a question? Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, again, a question for Mr Russell. Um, taking uh, on board everything Mr Russell has said about uh, how long uh, uh, the 10 metre setback would last uh, to SAT. Um, what about the, the placing of the shed in a posi position that appears to be deliberately placed between the applicant's house and the uh, objector's house? It appears to be trying to block the view, yet there's plenty of other locations on the, uh, on the site where the uh, shed could be placed without causing objection. Is, is, is that a reason to refuse it? to refuse it, that it could be placed somewhere else on the property and that would uh, create less of an amenity impact? I gather you're shaking your head, Mr Russell, the answer's no. No other further questions, councillors? Okay, we'll move on now, councillors, to item 3.12, which is the proposed classroom additions to an existing place of worship, lot 101, number 25, Suffolk Street, Cavisham. And our speaker is Mr Andrew Roberts from Mappel Building, the applicant speaking in support of the recommendation. Mr Roberts. Thank you, guys. Um, long, longish sort of night, so I'll try not to keep you too long. Um, so we're the applicant uh, for the DA 690-19 for the classrooms at uh, Suffolk Street. And we're generally in support of the recommendations of the officer's report. Um, to approve the current development application and the associated conditions of that approval. Um, I got asked to speak tonight at the request of the congregation, um, which is our clients for the application, um, just to uh, provide some additional support to some of the officer's recommendations uh, in case it's debated at the meeting um, that's coming up. Um, so the first one was um, this uh, proposed scheme amendment 176 uh, which has gone to the WAPC, has been approved by Council. Um, if it had come to eff into effect, the proposal of a non-conforming use as an extension of the existing non-conforming use would still be capable of approving, um, as noted in the report. Um, but given that it's not come into effect just yet, the proposal must certainly be more approvable, approvable uh, even given due regard to the proposed amendment um, being considered under the deemed provisions of the Town Planning and Development Act. Um, and then the Swan Valley Development Committee um, referenced several clauses of the um, Swan Valley Planning Act. Um, clause 8.6 was the compatibility of design and siting, landscaping, etc., with the character of the area. And 8.7 was the discouragement of uses that are incompatible with the natural character and traditional agricultural activities of the area. Uh, the, SW, the Swan Valley Planning Act um, the, those clauses of the Swan Valley Planning proposal represents a modest floor area increase, um, but that doesn't appear to be the biggest issue in respect to these clauses, um, so much so that the site's already been developed as a place of worship. Um, it's the visual impact from West Swan Road and Suffolk Street and the adjoining properties. So visibility of the development from West Swan Road is mitigated by the development being um, nestled against the existing building. Um, if you imagine the existing building being quite big and the development's quite small and you're looking at it from this direction, you see both of them, but the scale of them, the scale of the small one isn't any bigger as measured against the, the bigger one. Um, and then from Suffolk Street, um, the bigger one partially blocks the smaller one, so it's, it's there and there's a small extension off one side. Um, and you sort of have to look at the plan and drive past to fully understand that, but um, the visual impact increase isn't that significant. Um, and then it's also nestled against existing residential subdivision on the other side, which um, in plan view, it all looks like a flat landscape, but the residential subdivision is about three and a half or four metres higher with a big retaining wall in the direct vicinity of the church. 
So when you look from West Swan Road, past the classrooms, past the church, the roof of the church only barely comes get higher than the fence of the residential subdivision next door. So it's not, it's particularly the new classrooms aren't unduly adding to the impact of the visual amenity of the area. Um, there's potential for screening um, to West Swan Road and Suffolk Street and the adjoining neighbouring properties and proponents are prepared to install as much vegetative screening as deemed necessary to mitigate the visibility of the development. Um, it's reflected in the proposed conditions. Um, they note that they hadn't done it from the previous proposal but there's landscape and plan to be implemented and um, they're happy to implement that. In terms of impact of the bulk form, um, it's not considered too different visually from the recently completed pasta restaurant on lot 2931 on West Swan Road when that development's viewed from West Swan Road at a distance travelling in either direction. Um, it's no, it's, we note that ours are somewhat less visible despite a similar size profile to the side of that development from those viewing angles due to the increased setbacks of our development from West Swan Road. So it's similar to something that's already been approved. Um, and then given the, the, the foregoing it appears to be less of a built form issue, more of a use issue, which needs to be weighed against the community and local area tourism benefit. Um, it's noted clause 8.3 of the Act that the encouragement of tourist facilities provided, they do not detract from the rural character of the area. Um, whilst the facility is not deemed a tourist facility, there can be seen to be a community benefit to the proponents and also a broader Swan Valley locale and local tourism benefit. And this is as users of that facility will tend to become familiar with the area and frequent it more often and therefore have a propensity to sort of go into the area and promote custom and that within the area which is sort of generating public thoroughfare into and using the, the uh, businesses in the area, so promoting long-term viability of other tourism ventures. Um, I drew further attention to the officer's note that refusal would provide the opportunity for an appeal to SAT and um, that under the current framework, the use is strictly permitted um, until that amendment goes through. Uh, I note the estimated cost of defending a SAT appeal of the city of about 60,000 as a direct result of such appeal. Um, approval will leave the final decision of the WAPC on its merits and a rejection at that level may absolve the city from the cost of ensuring SAT appeal on that decision. Um, there's a couple of other clauses. 8.1 was the protection of viticulture. 8.4 was the encouragement of traditional activities in the Swan Valley and industries associated with viticulture, horticulture and cottage industry provided they're compatible with the rural character and the discouragement of uses that are incompatible with the rural character and traditional agricultural activities of the, act, of the area. Sorry, um, The original proposal was approved by the council and the WAPC with consideration to the inability to use the lot. Mr Roberts, you've got 30 seconds. Effectively for viticulture due to its size and at a time when the planning framework was more supportive of the place of worship being approved. The lot size hasn't changed. Um, the use has now been established and they're only talking about another 345 square metres of additional use on that lot. So I don't think it's going to um, impart a significantly increased detriment to the amenity of the area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Roberts. Questions, councillors? Councillor Coley. Thank you for the deputation. You, you mentioned here in the, uh, I'm sorry, we've only got it this evening as well, the application or the information between 12 and 2 p.m. that they would be used for religious education purposes, but elsewhere it talks about um, that the, the classrooms would be used for a range of community purposes yeah, sure. and the like. So it's not only between 12 and 2 p.m. Can you elaborate a little bit more about I'm, it? I'm at a slight loss because this was supposed to be two weeks from now yeah. and then um, for some reason it got brought forward to this meeting and the but gentleman in our office who'd been dealing with it yeah. So if we could assume though, would it be right to assume that the proposed use of the classrooms would be beyond just the 12 to 2 p.m.? I, I, could... I believe so. I don't know exactly what those uses are going to be beyond perhaps community groups that might like to hire the room for a, um, a small group craft activity or oh. education session or something along those lines. And, um, and... But if they're not, the 2 p.m. time is the same time as the church operates. So if they're using outside of that time, I think they've allocated eight car parking bays. So, and the site's got... And, and just one further question. Do you know whether the Western Australian Chin Christian Church Incorporated operate a school in any other area of Western Australia? Not that I'm aware of. In fact, there are classrooms operating at the current premises already, but they've outgrown them and hence the need to build the additional ones. So um, there's rooms at the end of the function centre of the building 
that are multi-purpose for meetings or classrooms and they just can't fit everybody into them. So hence the reason for... Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Perry? I just um, wish to point out to Councillor Kylie that they do Sunday schools at that area. They also do major community events for the Ching community as well on the Sunday afternoon after Mass as they normally get a significant number of them in there. So that's all the purpose of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Any questions, Councillors? Nothing further? Thank you, Mr Roberts. Okay, Councillors... It's just that there's a, a couple in the elderly couple in the gallery who um, want to make a deputation on um, item 3.7, and they've obviously not realised that they've had to, um, um, you know, register. register. And we've already um, had this one item that the deputation wasn't made for. So can we please have hear from them? 3.7. Yeah, we can take. Thank you. Take your response about the aged care. Could you just state your name, please? Yeah, Peter Ryan. Okay, well, Mr Ryan, you've got five minutes. Yeah, I, I, hopefully I won't take that long. <coughs> I live at 159 Cranley Street, Dayton. I'm here tonight. I'm representing four of the uh, residents in Cranley Street, uh, and it's regarding the uh, proposed childcare premises at, lot, at 152 Cranley Street. Uh, I just want to more or less that the councillors know why we are objecting to these uh, proposed childcare premises. Firstly, at the moment, there are three adults and two children living on these premises. It's a large block. We live on a large block because we were in the, uh, the old type when we all had five acres. And it's going to be replaced by this uh, childcare centre which will have 82 children and 12 staff and 20, 20 car bays. We think it's a bit ridiculous in a residential street to take five people away and put in 94. Uh, you might think in, in that street there aren't many of us. There's only five houses uh, to the west of 152 and three houses to the east of 152. On the opposite side of the street, there are only blocks. They haven't been built on yet. There's one house that's near completion and there's our own property. And further down, that's between Arthur Street and uh, uh, Isendoon Road now. It used to be the old Lord Street. And there's a further nine houses right down the end towards Isidone Street which are a fair distance from this. So we just think that because of five people moving out you're going to replace it with 94. It's a bit over the top. Also within 500 metres of that address there is a, a early le learning and daycare centre, SONAS, in the commercial area where the service station has been built and the proposed uh, shopping centre is going and on the original structural plan of Dayton which I was involved in in 2002 there's a proposal, I don't know if it's still there, of a primary school between Arthur Street and Blundell on Cranley Street and around the corner in those days they called the kindergarten, I presume it'll be another early learning centre or childcare centre but we've got one within 500 metres of it we really, with the, with the few people that live in Cranley Street, we don't need another, you know, 90, 94 people. And you can imagine uh, their cars would be, what, 100, 200 car movements a day in a, in a small street. So we just I wanted to bring it up to the other council, and I know a few of our councillors know about it, but to the other councillors, you might only have a few objections that w we've put in, but there wasn't many people that could object in that area. There's only about, you know, at the most about 18 houses involved in close proximity. So that's all we came for tonight and uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr Ryan. Um, you must have a question, Councillor Colley. Ask away. Uh, yeah, Peter, thanks for meeting with us a few months back too up at the, the shopping yeah, centre. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm just interested what your thoughts are on this, the saleability of the blocks across the road if the daycare centre goes ahead. I... When it first was mooted, I rang one of the uh, agents that was selling it 
And for some reason, it was Oakford agent. It's a long way from Dayton. And uh, I said to him, you know, you realise, you know, this is when your council sign was up there. He didn't know it was there. He, he wasn't committal on either side. I think he was 50-50. But um, the, uh, I haven't heard of any of the other agents sort of... Uh, uh, well, I don't, don't know them. They've got a sign there, you know, blocks for sale, but uh, I've never spoken to any of them. I think what I'm getting at is what, what's the parking situation like to, uh, you know, what, what chaos, if you, if, you, if you like, would it cause for parking in those oh, areas? Yeah, it's a fairly... Uh, uh, it would cause a lot. One of the neighbours right next door to it, he's a shift worker, he's absolutely terrified, and the other person, the other side, is an uh, elderly gentleman, uh, Frank, and uh, his wife is a bit immobile. Uh, yeah, the, the traffic would be... Uh, it's... It's a sort of a through road, a bit of a through road, Cranley Street, from the other end right down toward Blundell where there's more more housing. And now we've got a service station on the corner. So we do get not a lot of traffic, but another 100 or 200 movements a day would be unbelievable. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr Ryan? Thank you, Mr Ryan, for your patience. Thank you. The councillors, that takes care of all the deputations uh, in... Part B, I have no deputations. Part C, or deputations on competence item. So I'm going to run through the items, Council, and ask those that you wish to be withdrawn. And I'm going to ask you for your intent. So you've got a number of options. Intent might be, for example, recommendation, the office, office recommendation with approval with an amendment, refuse the application, a deferral, or an option within the report. Does everyone understand that? So if you've got an idea what you're going to do, you need to tell me now. OK, uh, 2.1 is the Allenbrook Security Patrols. Okay. Sorry, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm going to withdraw that to go with the option two option of the two. Officer do, officers. Thank you, Council. Anyone else on that one? 2.2 .2 is the proposed Brockman Community Centre 15% design. Councillor Kiley. Uh, either refusal or an amendment, Mayor. It's a bit each way. So we'll put down as you're not sure what you're going to do yet, but you'll make up your mind later. OK. Um, 3.1 is the adopt amendment for um, the local planning scheme, number 17, industrial general use, Tech. Upper Swan. Upper Swan. Councillor, Zin, Councillor Henderson. I'll be moving option two, Mayor. Uh, 3.2 is the final adoption of uh, number 171 local planning scheme 17 to the caravan park in Bullsbrook. None. Um, 3.3 is the proposed Henley Book structure plan. Well, I'd like to know what, what, you, what your intent is. We'll put it down. You're going to okay, possible refusal. Okay, three point three is the Henley Book Structure Plan. Yes. Okay, okay, Councillor Councillor Congerton, you were first. Your intention, amendment to the officer's recommendation. Councillor was a dead eat next. I think Councillor Perry was next. Same. Um, Councillor Catalano. You're fine. Councillor Colley. Uh, just OK, recommendation with the amendment. Yep. So it's, well, if you're on the same part, you might as well talk to each other about it. Um, 3.4 is the proposed change of use for a place of worship um, in Albert Road. You want to draw it, but you're not sure why. Can't hear yeah. Do, yeah. Can you put your microphone on, Councillor? Now that I've heard the um, deputations tonight, I have to have a think about it and um, really consider Well, in that case, it. you don't know what you want to do with it, so we'll just leave that and you exactly. can tell us later on. thank you. Um, Councillor Lucas, you indicated 3.5 and your intent? Approval with amendment to Condition 4. Amendment to Condition 4. Okay. 
3.8 is the um, shed on Banrock Road Vines. No one? Proposed shed Memorial Drive Baskerville. Yeah. Councillor Zeno, Nuno, in your intent, Charlie? Uh, just to approve it with a, uh, an amendment. Okay, 3.12 is proposed classroom additions to place of worship in Suffolk Street. Uh, 3.12 uh, at this point. Oh, Suffolk Street. To do. No, I'm going through the deputations now at the moment. The ones we've had deputations on there, next one is 3.12, Suffolk Street, and then we go to the rest. All right, remaining on. That's the Suffolk Street one, Charlie. Okay. Now that brings. We haven't got to 3.10 yet, Councillor. We'll get there. Okay, that brings us to the remaining. That was 3.12. Councillor Zanino intends to move a deferral. 3.6, Councillors, the proposed auxiliary dwelling at number uh, lot 70, number 164, Hadra Road, Baskerville. 3.7 is the proposed childcare facility in Cranley Street, Dayton. You want to, to that's the daycare? Have to withdraw that, thank you. To do. What's your intent, Councillor? To oppose the... Um, oppose the recommendation? Yes. Okay, 3.10 is the proposed outbuilding of the existing place of worship in Suffolk Street, Cavisham. Different one, security booth. Put it together with the other one. Uh, 3.11 is the proposed outbuilding of lot 3, number 624, Great Northern Highway, Hearn Hill. No one. 4.1 is the proposed temporary road closure at the intersection of Bordeaux and Farnborough, the Parkway, the Vines. 4.2 is the main roads WA request council's concurrence to dedicate a land as public road as part of Northlink WA. 4.3 is a petition request additional permanent kangaroo signage surrounding the Vines Golf Course. Mayor, an amendment to that one. Okay, so it offers a recommendation with an amendment. That's what you're doing, Council? Yep. Okay, list of accounts paid. Um, the financial management report. Budget adjustments. Interest, okay. 5.5 okay. is the change of basis evaluations. Um, then we have um, item C, which is Councillor Jones, closure of pedestrian pathway in Allenbrook. Councillor Catalano for the five minutes. Uh, yes, well, I, I'm actually going to um, ask for it to be deferred. You're going to move a deferral? Yes, thank you. Okay, and the other one will be um, C3.1, which is confidential item. Councillors, are there any? There are none before we close. Okay, thank you, councillors. There's a lot of information gone before us tonight. You've got an opportunity to meet with the staff prior to next week. And I remind you, councillors, to reduce the number of motions on the fly. Thank you. Good night, councillors.